Protein, everybody knows it's important. It's actually essential. So proteins are made up of amino acids. Does it really matter where you get it from? Some people say no. Uh, animal sources of protein, vegan sources of protein. Doesn't matter, just get your protein. Other people say, yes, it does matter. Who's right? Well, we have a meta-analysis that breaks this down, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Protein, which one's the best? I saw something floating around saying? Instagram. Is Was it a, a new study that just got released? Was or it was it a meta-analysis. Oh, oh. Yeah, so, so made it, for people who know what that is, a right? collection of a bunch of studies. S studies, right? They look at a bunch of studies and try and find a consensus because uh, you know one study can give you some answers, but multiple studies will often point in a particular direction. You get a much more clear picture. Wouldn't you say? I, I'm not sorry to interrupt you, but I actually think this is kind of a, a good a, a good point or to talk about and address is actually single studies aren't good. I, they're really, I mean, one study doesn't prove a lot because of the room for error. And the time frame normally, yeah. and the other potential the sample variables, size, sample size. size of One study that points in a direction or something like that. To me, the the most valuable thing about it says, oh, we what it highlights more than anything. Oh, we should investigate this. Correct. Mm -hmm. We should pay attention or look into this. There might be something there. Yes. I don't think until you get to a until you get to a meta analysis, does it really go? Okay, I think we're on to something here. That's no, kind of how I look at you it. Yeah, very well said. Yeah. I mean, it should it should. Um, get the interest of scientists to continue to look further. And if you can duplicate a study, right? If, stu if a study is duplicatable consistently, then you know that you found um, some truth. But single studies will essentially point you in a direction, but they're not necessarily truth, or you shouldn't necessarily look at them and go, oh, here's the conclusion, period, of end, and end of story. And so meta analysis are great because they'll look at multiple studies. And they'll say, all right, what is the general consensus? What's the general conclusion? What are we seeing across all these different studies? And then based off that, it's you can often make uh, a conclusion like, okay, this seems to work and this doesn't seem to work. So the deal with protein is when you look at protein, now a protein is defined as a, a string of all of the essential amino acids. Okay. So that, that gives you a protein. Now, you can have different concentrations of different types of amino acids in a particular type of protein. Some amino acids are great for forming certain neurotransmitters. Other amino acids are great for anabolic activity, right? Stimulating muscle protein synthesis. There's other amino acids that are good for skin or gut health and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, some are precursors to nitric oxide, which opens up the blood vessels, allows for blood to flow better. So not all proteins are the same, um, and you also want to look at the availability of the protein or to put it more, I guess, more plainly, how easily or well it's utilized or absorbed. Can you assimilate it? Yeah, that makes a big difference, right? Because yeah. now a gram of protein isn't just a gram of protein or uh, one gram of protein from one source isn't the same as another gram of protein. So what, what people often or what scientists look at is, okay, well, which protein is best for muscle recovery, which protein is best for muscle building, strength, endurance, gut health. They've identified a lot of these different types of things. And this made analysis they did, I believe there's 33 studies that they examined. They found that animal sources of protein, now this is, again, this is lots of studies have shown, this is what the made analysis shows. Animal sources of protein are superior in a gram per gram basis for muscle growth and for muscle strength. When it comes to endurance, there's a little bit of a benefit, but not much. Hmm. But when it comes to strength and muscle growth, if you're looking for the best bang for your buck, right? Ease of assimilation, yeah. uh, high concentration of the amino acids that are responsible for muscle growth and recovery, it's animal sources. And, and you know, uh, this points to what bodybuilders and strength athletes have known yeah. for a long time. It's rare. This is why it makes a big, it makes a splash when you hear this, right? It's rare when you find a strength athlete who doesn't eat animal sources of protein. That's why it makes it such a big deal. Like, oh, look at this vegan bodybuilder. Yeah. It's like one out of a million. <laughs> yeah. Right? No. So was that was that one of the main like advantages was the fact that it was like more bioavailable. It was just easier to assimilate in terms of your body recognizing that in comparison to a, a veg vegetable protein source? Yes. Yeah. In fact, I'll pull up the, I, it, the it, breakdown. I know. I wonder if it was the same one that I read. I, I thought it said something like double. Like, I want In to see some like, cases, it was like 26. Wow. Yeah. 
That's what got my attention. Yeah. In, like, so, in some cases, I know I, we've talked about this before, right? It's not a, it's not new that we've had this conversation, but you know, I, I for the most part, I was like, oh, it's probably a pretty splitting hair difference. You know, what I'm yeah, saying? yes, be it's a little bit like minuscule. It's like yeah. for me as a coach with my clients, it's always been hit your protein intake. Uh, if you if you end up getting it with uh, soy or yeah. vegan sources, well, that's step one. I don't care. Yeah. You know, what I'm saying just get just get it because that's going to make the biggest difference. But actually seeing on a on a gram for gram basis that it was l literally almost double the impact. I thought and that was really for interesting. Immune, for muscle protein synthesis, yeah, like beef protein uh, will give you a much stronger effect uh, for protein synthesis, right? Positive protein synthesis, meaning your body is essentially building muscle with uh, a far lower dose than, let's say, a plant source. Now, that's not the full story, of course, because the larger dose of plant protein may not stimulate the same protein synthesis signal, but it does come with extra calories. And calories, if they're above your maintenance or whatever, are also protein sparing. So you may not necessarily need as loud of uh, an anabolic, you know, okay. muscle protein synthesis signal, right? So where this becomes hmm. most important is definitely when you're in a deficit. When you're in a calorie deficit, you want every gram of protein to be as anabolic as possible. When you're in a surplus, all those extra calories, carbs, fats, they, they start to become protein sparing. In other words, because your calories are so high, your body's not breaking down protein like it would if you were in a low calorie environment. But if you're cutting, then it becomes very important what kind of protein you take in. So I have a question for you then, Sal. So we, uh, are, you've often said that um, good rule of thumb for vegans is probably to supplement with creatine. Yeah. Just generally speaking, it's a it's a good it's a for great sure thing. for vegans, right? So for sure for vegans, knowing what you know now about EAAs, would you also throw that category? I in always there? did. I always mm -hmm. had vegan supplement. That was the one category of clients that I had that I always had take essential amino acid supplements for for two reasons. One, because it made a big difference in their progress, but two, essential amino acids are vegan. Mm -hmm. So you know, getting them to take a protein powder, my options were vegan. And that's it. Or, hey, take these, start drinking essential amino acids uh, throughout the day. Um, and because they're made through the fermentation process, so th this is how they make essential amino acids. It's not, a, it's not a, it's not, ve it's vegan, essentially. It's non-animal source, but you get those essential amino acids. Huge difference. I remember one guy in particular, um, when I was doing jujitsu and I was heavy into it, he was a vegan and he was complaining about age. That's what he came to. He's like, man, what's going on? I'm older now. I'm, I think he was 38 at the time. And he's like, I'm not recovering that fast. And I said, try drinking uh, essential amino acids before and after training. And he gained, I think he gained four pounds of lean body mass just from doing that. And he's like, bro, I feel huh. way different. Wow. Just from supplementing. Wow. So yeah, that makes, and creatine, by the way, uh, makes a huge difference for most people. But it especially makes a huge difference for vegans because the you get creatine from animal sources. Now your body can synthesize creatine through amino acids, but it's not going to make enough to really reap all the benefits. Yeah, and so that. what you see in the studies, if you ever look at studies on creatine and IQ, yeah. huge impact on vegans. They actually get a boost in, in IQ. Massive cognitive boost. Yeah. yeah. So if I had a vegan client, it was like creatine essential amino acids. That's what we're going to Which take. has more to do with that. They're probably deficient in it, and then you're replacing it. They need it's it way like, more. It's like saying that, uh, oh my God, magnesium gives you incredible sleep. It's like, well, if you're deficient in it, and then you supplement it with it, absolutely, it can be life-changing like that. Same thing. Totally, right? totally. Yeah. It was 31 studies that they that they went through. Here's that the researchers concluded in the meta-analysis. While plant-based protein ingestion demonstrates superior efficacy compared to low or no pre protein ingestion, so in other words, it's better to eat high protein regardless, um, it is not as effective as other protein types, such as whey, beef, or milk protein, in, in enhancing athletic uh, performance. So uh, endurance, similar. Strength, definitely not. Definitely not the what, same. What is the relationship between uh, protein and like skin health? Oh, very. I know, I know. I know. Fat plays a role. Healthy fats play a role. Is uh, protein as as important or more important? Would you say than that? Yeah, your skin is made up of protein. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, we have a free guide. It's the benefits of eating whole foods. This gives you a shopping list. What foods are best for proteins, fats, carbohydrates? There's recipe samples. It's all based on real, whole, natural foods, and it's a free guide. It's totally free. You can get it if you go to wholefoodsguide.com or by clicking on the link in the description below. Your skin is made up of collagen matrixes and, and it is proteins, uh, proline, 
Um, I think valine, if I'm not mistaken, I know proline is one of the main amino acids in, in collagen. Yeah, if, uh, one of the side effects of eating low protein is skin that looks old and weak weathered, yeah. and weathered mm -hmm. and that bruises or, or, or damages easily. Yeah. So you'll see, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but my clients, when yeah. I would bump their protein intake, because, and we were looking for muscle gains and performance. Uh, I, I'd say, oh yeah, at least half of them would come to me, but like my skin, my skin looks a lot better. It looks more youthful. Yeah, it is, and that's like the foundational skin health, right? Is get essential fatty acids, uh, make sure that's a, a adequate, high protein diet, hydration, and then you want to balance out your skin's uh, microbiome. So a good probiotic, and then if you use any kind of skincare product, you want ones that promote a nice balanced microbiome. And unfortunately, most skincare products- uh, Disrupt it. They, they disrupt it or wipe it out. They'll yeah. completely wipe it out. And then what happens is it sets the stage for the wrong kind of bacteria. It's like nuking your skin. And then now it sets the stage for the wrong kind of bacteria. Well, it's basically take like taking an antibiotic for your skin, right? Yes. Same same concept. And we know how bad an antibiotic can be for your gut. And we've, totally. we finally figured that out, like, hey, at all costs, trying to avoid so that. So this is why Caldera. So Caldera is a company we work with, right? And they have a skin serum. And what you what we get, we've been working, how long have we been working with them now? It's been three a, years. Three years, right? Yeah. We get years. messages from people with dry three, skin, four. oily skin, acne, uh, psoriasis. Every single person was like, it, it, it helps my skin out. Yeah. It's it's because it's balancing out the microbiome on their skin mm. because of the natural botanicals in there that encourage the growth uh, and proliferation of good bacteria, help stop the proliferation of bad bacteria, and then reduce inflammation. So it's like a foundational skin uh, skin health, essentially. And, and I would imagine this is one of those things, too, that you'd be even better off if you're more preventative with it, too. So instead of waiting until you have bad skin or issues with your totally. skin, is you're constantly kind of using things like that totally. to keep it healthy so totally. you don't age. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, back to, back to protein. Like, unless you're eating ungodly amounts of protein and you're getting so many amino acids from all the different sources, it's not a big deal. Um, but I, I, mean, I have yet to meet anybody who's hitting, consistently hitting those really high targets. And you're not a and, and you're not a vegan. Like the animal sources are gonna are gonna be great for you. So if you have to choose between two protein meals, one's animal and one's you know plant. Not to mention, by the way, I don't know if you guys ever tried this, but um, animal sources are easier to digest. So for some people, 50 grams of protein from beans doesn't feel very good yeah. in your gut. It does, just doesn't feel very good. No. The so the super high, you know, protein intake from vegan sources gets very difficult because you get a lot of gastric uh, distress, which then it reduces uh, protein assimilation even more. Yeah. Now you're making these even harder. No. Have you, you know, ever seen result? somebody? Well, I saw this one. Um, this guy was trying to kind of argue in terms of like that we were uh, vegetarian. Like, uh, what? And, yeah. And <laughs> that we were? Yeah. That like humans are Haven't supposed to be vegetarian and oh. <laughs> that we've you know, we've evolved past like, because people, people kind of attribute like, well, they see lions for instance, and, and, you know, and they're mammals. And so, but we've, we've evolved past that to where we don't use cruelty and all these things. And so we don't, uh, we don't need to kill. So we're trying to, we're trying to be civilized and now like evolve past that. And he's saying his argument was that, um, because our jaw moves left to right, like, in, in, cause we can graze, but we're omnivores, which, you know, he's, he was trying to say that we're herbivores because of that fact. And so anyway, I'm like, what about the canines? You know, I'm like, I'm like, ah, I want to get in there and like say something we, to the we, video. We've hunted for as long as we have artifacts. We find spears. There's no hunter gatherer. I, I feel like the show alone is hunt. such a, the way I would argue that. I like, know. Go watch alone. Go watch a season of that. And tell me, tell me like what happens to everybody. You literally who, die. Who, yeah. <laughs> because and, and that's like a short period of time. This isn't like for years. This is like, these people can't even survive six months without, if they don't find a meat source, they end up having to get off the island because yeah. they literally, or they kicked them off because of how your, malnutrition they your, are. Your yeah. best form of evidence of this is that uh, proteins and fats are essential. Carbohydrates are not. So proteins right. and fats you get from animal. You could kill one animal and get everything you need. Yeah. You yeah. get all the essential nutrients, macro and micro. I'm not saying that that's ideal, but you get them all. You're not going to get, there isn't a plant that you're going to find that'll do that, that'll meet those nutrient yeah. needs. It's just not going to happen. You're dead. I just like to hear crazy people in their ideas sometimes, <laughs> you know, it's just like, okay, well, like explain yourself, like your thought process. And like, he, he had a really like in-depth way of looking at it that was completely wrong, but I was like, but, hmm, interesting. You know, I you think that I respect 
the vegans who have the really strong moral, um, you know, sure. they, it's like their, their moral compass is like, don't hurt uh, living things except for plants, right? Plants don't count, but don't hurt living things. And so if that's your, like the top of your moral compass, yeah. um, then you're going to come up with all kinds then of Then you got to let spiders bite you. You're going to, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You got you got to let them do it. Yeah, you're gonna come up with all kinds of arguments <laughs> yeah. and, and, and stuff. Plus, the, the farming boy that kills a lot of animals. I don't know. How, I don't know. You don't even. I know those kill stats are interesting. Tons right? of animals yeah. and, and rodents yeah. and stuff like that. No, no, no it doesn't but, exist. Yeah. I mean, it's it's great that we live in a time that all this stuff is an option. Yeah, you know, it's great that you can actually make that. Like that just wouldn't even be an option. No, just, you know, a little over a hundred years ago, it was like that's just not possible. Dude, I have in our forum. Did you guys see the Nicole? I think was her name her reverse diet success story? No. Oh. I missed that. So people have heard us talk about reverse dieting um, on the show. Oftentimes we recommend it to callers. So reverse diet is is what it sounds, right? So you're, you're slowly increasing your calories <clears throat> in combination with strength training in an attempt to build muscle and speed up your metabolism so that you increase your body's caloric demands uh, and then setting yourself up later for a better quote unquote cut, right? So- if your metabolism, just give it, I'll just paint the picture so people kind of get it. If your body is running on 1,500 calories a day and you want to lose 20 pounds of body fat, you don't have much room to go. Like, where are you going to go? 1,000 calories? And then you're stuck, right? A reverse diet would build some muscle, speed up your metabolism, get you to, let's say, 2,500 calories, and now you have room to do a cut and then burn the body fat. And then also be in a place that's sustainable. And reverse diets uh, are, they work. They really do work. And I know a lot of people hear it and it's like, does it, I, don't, I don't know how that works. Does that make sense? But then they try it. They do it right. They feel better. They get energy. Their metabolism speeds up. They start to burn body fat and it trips them out. Well, I, we have a success story in our forum. And this one's crazy because she, she posted um, her her stats. She posted her, her, her test. So this was from Nicole. She's in our forum. She's in our, our coaches forum. Oh, okay. So she said, just wanted to share a personal testimony for those with clients who feel nervous to go into reverse diet out of fear of gaining weight. So on the left, so she's point. she posted her stats. Okay. On the left was at the end of her cut in mid December. It was 1,365 calories on the right was the end of her six month reverse diet which ended at 3,000 calories. Here's what happened. 3,000 calories? So she went from 1,365 to 3,000. Now, a lot of people would be like, well, you probably just gained a bunch of body fat. You just more than doubled your calories. No, mm -hmm. because she did it right. She strength trained. And she did it slowly probably yep. over Here's that time. what she did. Through that process, she lost an additional 25 pounds of body fat and gained 16 pounds of muscle. 25, 25? pounds? 25 pounds of body fat drop. Wow. And her skeletal muscle mass went up 16 pounds. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so her metabolism got so much faster that she continued to lose body fat through this process. That's so and, epic. And, and now, now she was stuck, right? 1,365 calories. She had 25 pounds of body fat to lose. What would she do? Go yeah. down to 800 calories? Yeah. 700 yeah, calories? Right. Now you, you go from you, there. No, terrible. So that's just a personal story. So since you brought that up, this brings uh, me to cool. a point that I, I mean, I, I want us to, to be, uh, try and be consistent with communicating to the our, our broader audience about our test group of GLP-1 because I think that's still such a important conversation. A hot topic mm -hmm. too. And, uh, you know, I, I recently have come off completely off. It's been a few weeks now that I've been off completely. Uh, and we're starting to see this in, in this group, right? There's, I mean, m remember we have 50 something people in there. And so there's a wide range of where people are at in their journey, how long they've been taking GLP-1s. Yeah. And so- this is more like me generally talking about it, but there seems to be something that I think that we're going to continue to see. And it's going to be a very common theme with even the people that have tremendous success mm -hmm. with the GLP ones. And it's actually very similar to what led me to eventually coming completely off is everyone knows that I took it. I just kind of allowed it to take its course. And if I was somebody who uh, thought of himself as really overweight or fat or in insecure about that. And I just wanted to get my weight down. Uh, that Those eight weeks where I dropped 30 pounds would have been a huge success. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like I definitely looked leaner. Yeah, I pumped on that. Yeah. yeah, I would have been super pumped. Now I was down to like two meals a day and under 2000 calories sometimes. And, you know, from that point, it was like, okay, now I'm done doing it. Let's reverse diet and come out the other way. Well, what I found was, okay, I went down to a micro dose. And so I could get my calories up to about 2,200, then 2,400, then 2,600. 
And then I kind of started to hit a wall around 2,800 calories. 2,800 calories. Uh, and by the way, along that process, you know, I feel like I'm building a little bit of muscle, seeing a little bit of strength. Energy is kind of coming back a little bit. Uh, I'm at 15.8% body fat. So if I'm going off of that, I want to be down to say nine or 10, let's mm -hmm. say. So I want to lose body fat, but I can't from the place that I was at. I was already below 2000. So I'm not going to, if anything, I'm going to, even if I lose weight on the scale, most likely I'm going to also be losing muscle too. I'm not even getting close right. to 150 grams of protein at that low of calorie. So the inevitable, I had to reverse and come out. And so I think this is something that we're going to continually see even with the success of the GLP-1. It seems to be really common for people to lose an initial amount of weight because of the reduced calories. And this is the average person. They're not strength training. They're not trying to hit protein targets. They're just taking a GLP-1. It makes them eat a lot less. They'll lose an initial amount of weight and then they plateau because their body adapts to the low calories and then they're stuck. Yeah. And we see people like this in the group because in the group that we're, that we're working with, there are people in there that have been on a GLP-1 for a long time. Yeah. yeah. Like I mean, there's one woman we talked to. Right? There was one woman we talked to who had been on for two years, yeah. but she had plateaued at the body weight that she was at for a long time. I don't remember how long it was. She's like, I've been at this weight for like eight months or something like that. Yeah. I'm not losing any more weight. I'm barely eating. So she started a reverse diet, got her calories way up, didn't gain any weight, obviously felt way more energy, way better, and yeah. way stronger, now setting herself up. For for sure, the, what you if you're a coach listening and you're, you're thinking about working with people on GLP-1s, the name of the game is going to be reverse dieting before you get on. Yeah, yeah. Right away. Right. And how to break plateaus and then how to get people to hit their protein and strength train. Otherwise, look, to use, use an example, Adam, you got down, what was your body weight at the end of that? 199. 199. Yeah. 15% body fat. Yeah. Under normal circumstances, how you gotten your body weight down in 199 with strength training, no GLP-1, eating high protein, what do you think your body fat would have been at? Well, bro, I, I hit stage for uh, nationals at 203 at 3% body right, fat, right? you know? So I, I was four pounds heavier and way more muscle on yep. me. And, and so, and this is what's probably happening yeah. to, yeah. now that's me kind of taking a shot at the GLP ones as far as this is a negative thing. If you're not aware of this, you're not paying attention to it, you don't set yourself up, yeah. this could be the problem. Now, let me tell you what I think is actually really cool though, that I've actually really enjoyed about going through that process is, it cut out the the cravings and the noise for so long that I built all these better food choice behaviors yeah. around eating that now that I'm on the reverse diet and I'm coming back. No cravings? No, I'm, no temptation to You've do. You weakened those neural didn't pathways. Come back. Not at all, dude. Wow. Like it's, it is awesome how little I want any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so now what I know, just like probably a heroin addict or any addict with alcohol, drugs, anything, is that, I'm, I'm smart enough to know that I enjoy the fact that I don't have this pull to it. So I'm not even going to fuck around with trying it. Because like, you'll, you'll rebuild those neural that's pathways right. real like, fast. Like, I just feel so blessed that this thing yeah. helped cut that, that I don't have this tie or this pull or this urge or this like, oh, I got a white knuckle and I want to go get the ice cream so bad. Like, no, I, I'm on the diet. I got to stay. Like, yeah. I don't feel that at all. At all, at all, at all. Which, that is incredible. So this is why... This is the part of me that's so pro these GLP ones for certain if people. If you use it this way, yeah. Because there is peop there are a lot of people, in fact, most people that are 50, 100 plus pounds overweight have a lot of bad relationships with food like this and binging and just cravings and and medicating with food that they've been dealing yep. with for years. And they just basically need help to break the chains long enough yes. to weaken those neural pathways, weaken those behaviors so that when they come off, if they do it right, they don't have to, they don't go back on. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so that is going to be the, the key. And this is why too, I think, man, all the coaches and trainers are listening. You have an opportunity to play such a massive role in helping these people instead of don't be the trainer on there. I've, and I've seen the people that come before, Oh, I can't believe these guys, they sold out. They're so pro GL. Like, man, you're an idiot. Like it's here. <laughs> Yeah. It is here and millions of people are going to do it. So you can be over there and shame all these people that have been struggling with weight their whole entire life, or you can get the fuck in there and try and help them. Yeah. And we're trying to give you these keys to help these people. And it can absolutely be life-changing for somebody who's been suffering from obesity for if years. If it's done the right yeah. way, I think that this is going to be one of the most potentially effective tools for people who've been struggling with weight 
for a long time. But this is going to be the, this is going to be the crux right here. This yep. is going to yeah. be the other part of it too, Adam. And I have to say this: the other part of it is the dosing. Um, a lot of the, mm -hmm. the the so GLP ones that you have your, your their generic compound, and then you have the brand name ones, right? The brand name ones often come with established doses. Mm -hmm. Like it, this is how much you take. Yeah. In if what we're understanding right now through the doctors that we've worked with, and we're not doctors, but we've talked to these doctors and they're on the cutting edge and they've been doing these, some of them have been doing them for, for, for a decade. They'll tell you there seems to be a variance from individual to individual huge, and getting the dose, huge variance, yeah. getting the dose is right. Uh, getting the dose right is very important. It's crazy. It's standardized. Like yes. That. So, so like if you go, if you go, like we work with partners at mphormones.com. The doctors there work with the generic, which allows you to, to to use like much different doses. You could go lower, you could go higher, and they'll work with you versus the standard. No, no, no. This is what you take, and then and then people come back. Oh my god, it's too strong, or I don't feel it, and then they triple it, and oh my god, now it's too strong type of deal. There is a a pretty wide variance on how people react. And uh, to these. what I yeah. so again using my personal experience of going through this. Um, I was really fascinated with. So remember, I just cut this out two or three weeks, three weeks ago now. I cut it out completely. But even the the previous four weeks or more, but that I was half or a quarter of the dose yeah. and still reaping the benefits of that. So that's the other thing too, is that it doesn't need to be, if you're using it for what I'm saying, where you're like, you're just trying to help break these bad behaviors mm -hmm. around binging and things like that. Like it, it still was enough of a signal, even with a small dose like that, to help that keep at bay. It reminds me of there was some there was one person in our group, and this is the second time she said this. I'm, I know you guys caught this, where she said, uh, "This is the first time in my life that I don't feel preoccupied, or 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 I'm constantly thinking about food." Mm -hmm. So the first time, she's like, "And I'm enjoying this so much. It's so freeing for anybody who has a a uh, an addiction or a behavior yeah. that they can't that they struggle with for years." To feel the urge to engage in it disappear. It's a is, big weight that's lifted. It's got to feel so freeing. And so now she doesn't have to engage in that behavior anymore. And she could do this for a while, allow those neural pathways to weaken. And then Create the ideal situation is come off, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do it all right. Strength train, hit your protein, come off. And then now you have more control. Like, okay, I, you know, I, I feel like it's not as strong as it was. Well, yeah, because you weren't. Um, and you, you weren't engaging this behavior for six months or a year, however long you were on this thing. Yeah. That could be very freeing for a lot of people. It's just funny because of the scare of like, especially with coaches, that this is going to disrupt our industry. This is going to take over. Like there's so much more need for coaches yes. this, that this just showed itself, you know, and it's like, it's, it's very much parallel to how we already work with clients. It's just to what you guys are saying, this may actually provide I, somebody that momentary opportunity to really get in there and address the behavior. Here's how annoying to me that the scarcity mindset is that trainers can often have. Here, here They are literally, um, it's the opposite of what some of them are thinking. Yeah. The GLP-1 cultural phenomena, right? This this new intervention that's, you know, at some point, some estimates are like 60% of people are going to be on this type of deal. And I think that's probably true. Um, good and bad, right? Uh, I think it's going to increase the, uh, the need and the demand for trainers and coaches. I think it yep. will not decrease. Here's what it's going to do. It's going to increase the awareness around strength training. And it's going to encourage people who gave up to try again. Yeah, they have a new uh, light. They have a new, new motivation. Option. Like, oh my God, I got this thing. And oh, I'm not, I feel like I finally got a grip on this thing with diet. Now I'm going to go work with a trainer. Whereas before, like, forget it, I give up. I don't even think this is a question. It, it, it Because by itself, it's not going to be successful. By itself, no. yeah. the average person who just goes out, spends the money on whatever name brand, they set them up on a prescription, they go do it, they need to lose 50 or 100 pounds. Even if they lose the 50 to 100, I'm telling you right now, it will not be, a, yeah, it won't be successful. It won't be a lifelong successful thing. That's the part that's going to be tough too, is that they're going to have, they're, they're, there's going to be uh, the, the doctors that are pushing the prescription and are saying things like, you can be on it forever, you know, and mm -hmm. are going to want you on it forever are going to say that, oh, yeah, like if you want to keep this weight down, just keep taking yeah. it, taking it. That's going to be, in my opinion, the, the dangerous route. The more optimal route here is if you know you're somebody who has had these issues with food and you recognize that this tool mm -hmm. helps you break that to rebuild new behaviors, the goal should be eventually to get off. The goal should be to come off of it 
to where you now have created new relationships. Which, by the way, if you do it right in that way, Adam, you'll get better results. Yes. You won't plateau. You'll have muscle and strength and mobility. You'll look better. You'll move better. You'll be able to eat more and burn more. I mean, that's that's not just the ideal, like, you know, like this is the best route because now you're not taking something forever, but it's actually the best route, period, across the board. Yeah, anyway, I, I got, I want to uh, bring something up that has to do with parenting that I thought, uh, I thought you guys would really enjoy. So there's this woman that I follow, Dr. Becky. She's got great, great content on raising kids. I think she's absolutely brilliant um, with how she communicates. And there was a post that she wrote. I'll read it to you. And I'd love your guys' uh, opinion on this. And I've, this, is, this, is, this has really impacted me in terms of, you know, how I approach certain things, especially with my teenage kids, because teenage kids are, they're, let's just say they're tough. <laughs> so she says, <laughs> yes. for parents, Firm boundaries are important for safety and growth, but then you have to have loving grace with the reaction to those boundaries. So when you set a boundary, especially with a teenager, they're going to react. And teenagers don't have, they don't have the emotional regulation that adults do for the most part. Teenagers are just, it's almost like they're big toddlers. Like they, they just, they can't control their emotions. So you give them a lot of grace with the reaction. Like, listen, you're not going to like this. Uh, I got to bring this up to you. I know it's been different, but you're going to, you know, we're not going to allow you to be on your phone in your room alone anymore, right? There's going to be a reaction. What the, what are you talking about? It's not fair, right? Yeah. Lots of grace around that. Not over explain the reasons for those boundaries because it actually doesn't matter. So you give them a reason, then you're done. But then providing trust and faith with consistency. And this is the most important part, calmness. Mm -hmm. So when they lose their shit, yeah. it's super important. You don't match that. That you're just chill about it yeah. and you're super cool and you give them grace with the reaction, but you stay consistent. Like, well, I, look, it's not going to change. Oh, I don't, I don't think this is a teenager thing. I think this is a entire All life parenting. of the kid. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> the thing that I strongly believe. I mean, imagine if your parents were like, I mean, my parents were like that. It would have been oh. so great. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I, I strong, My parents leveled up when I leveled uh, up. You know? I, yeah. yeah, or the, exactly. you know, because I told you so, you, yeah. know, you know, type of deal. You're grounded. No, I, I think that uh, I attribute a big part of Max's personality and his calmness and the way he is to Katrina and I's consistency around everything. Like he just, I, we, I've never raised my voice. I've never yelled. I've never been angry. I've never let, he's never felt that energy from me. That doesn't mean he hasn't done things that he's not supposed to, or he hasn't asked for things over and over. Like, but we've just remained so calm and so consistent and that we don't allow his moods or tiredness or if illness or all the things that make a, a toddler's emotions go up and down to ever affect our consistency on how we communicate to him. And because of that, it's been wild to watch him ha have these moments and us just, I mean, we literally can just kind of look at him and let him have the little moment or whatever he's doing and be like, okay, are you done? Like, you know, that's not how you do that. If you want this and we talk to him like an adult, like if you would like to do this, then you tell mommy and daddy, this is what you like to do. Sometimes we're going to say yes to you because it's okay for you. That other times- and You're just consistent. Yeah. And we just, that's how we talk. We yeah. like literally- explain why he's being told no or he can't do that and it doesn't change and that and that out. your uh overreaction emotionally and doing so that doesn't is not going to get your way in fact it's going to probably get, go the opposite and you won't get to do it because of that and so it's wild to watch him yeah, just i mentioned teenagers because uh a toddler throwing a tantrum is so different than a, a, a teenager knows what to say they know how to push your buttons they really and it's also well, it's also to manipulate yeah but you can't yes, it's, it's also tricks you but stop right there okay yeah. don't you believe that part of that is because we train them to know what gets our what gets us of course they're smart like, yeah. they're like they're teenage, smarter well, they, than they, teenager. Also, they pay they they train you yeah so yeah. it's 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 vice versa so they also have ways of manipulating like your behaviors and using it against you and yeah yeah like i mean it's very much it's it's the same tactics it's just magnified because these new hormones have like really elevated yeah, yeah. And i think that's really like what you're trying to totally to bring about because i've noticed that with ethan is because he's not he was very chill and he's very like and it was not even something i considered uh in terms of like having to maintain composure and maintain like this sort of calmness uh but like when the reaction is like whoa it, it throws you on your heels because you're like that's never come out of you you know like this is weird uh but yeah he's he's going through that and it's a big swing and it's like this and then that and then but you just give him the space and it, it's the same same yeah like that's why i feel like it'll be the same thing i feel yeah. like if he were to do that obviously i'm not a teenager so i guess we'll cross that bridge one there 
But I feel like Katrina and I are so united in how we do deal with those things that if my calm max ends up getting testosterone and ends up being Ethan, I still think her and I would just kind of like look at each other and then look at him and then like wait for it to pass. It'll and then be, be the, like, it'll be the same. Do you really yeah. think that's going to work with your mom yeah. and dad? Yeah. Like, You'll notice how different he's going to like, uh, he's dealing with it, but yeah, it'll be like a similar tactic. You, know you guys are already applying. And you know what the tough thing is too, is that when you look at a teenage kid, cause they can verbalize and they're intelligent is you, it's, you, it's easy to assume that they should be able to not do that. Like, like, what are you doing? Like, yeah. why are you acting that way? But if you look at the the science on their brains and how they react, it's very they, emotional. It's just still. a more intelligent toddler brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a more just, just, as, emo just, as, just as emotional, yeah. if not more. Yeah. And it's impulsive, yeah. and they don't, you know. And sure. how they feel now is how they're always going to feel. That's my favorite. I remember when I learned that. I learned that from a behavior specialist. Like, you know, what a teenager when they say that they feel a particular way, they think they believe they're always going to feel that way. And yeah. when you remind them that they felt different, they'll disagree with you. And it's like, oh yeah, that's true with kids. Like. What do you mean you used to like this? I never liked that. Like, what are you talking about? Like, two weeks ago, bro. That's such me. a profound thing to understand. <laughs> That's so crazy. The other thing that was always yeah. profound for me to like wrap my brain around too with kids is just like their their time, their uh, uh, understanding of time is so different than so yours different. too. So like you, something to yeah. them that feels like, you know, for them, two months of us doing a certain thing in the family yeah. is like a lifetime for them. You know, it's like a big, it's a big portion of their life where yeah. you're going like, come on, bro. It's been two months that we haven't done this or that. It's like, oh, wait a yeah. second. Their perspective is like, or your kid that's forever, you know, your, your teenage kid will ask for something. You'll be like, uh, I think we should wait about a year for that. It's, it's like I told you a hundred years. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it's a year. Oh my God, a year. Yeah. Like that's nothing. it's funny though, because they're back to like you know how they kind of pick up on like what you do and your tactics and like and he's because he kind of was throwing that back at me. He's like, it's not always a learning lesson, Dad. You know, it's not always a lecture out of this moment right now. I'm just feeling this and blah, you know. And he was like trying to express to me like I'm having my own moment. This isn't about like whatever you're gonna say next, you know. And I'm just like, what? Like I, I, but yeah, I'm like, yeah, you're right. Like I, I do that. Bro, I can't how help wild it. Is it. Hey, how wild is it gonna be if ever it ends up being like the super calm teenager? And, oh. that, and Ethan ends up being like your drama queen. Like, I don't know. It might it'd be it, so wild if they do like a it, It's kind of playing out like that. I don't know. It's weird. He started out early like, ah, yeah. you know, crazy. And, and then he's actually calming down quite a For lot. For me, the understanding the dysregulation part, uh, meaning that they can't, they don't have the ability right now to regulate, understanding that and being like, I'm going to wait until they're regulated and then and then we'll have a conversation. And I did that with my daughter once. She was like, ah, and you know, my instinct, because I was raised very differently, is to be like, well, you're uh, a force right now. I'm gonna be a bigger force. And then I'm gonna through yeah. fear, yeah. I'm gonna intimidate you. Right. But I didn't I didn't do that. I don't do that. And so I waited and then when things calmed down, I said, you'll have an opportunity to repair and it's gonna be up to you. Um, and that's going to help mend our relationship. Bro, it's so it's so powerful as a parent when you learn to to practice this because it, it, there's like it takes self work, dude. Well, bro, it's also it's kind of hilarious when you let it play out because some like they'll do their thing, and if you can just remain like calm, like eventually they'll you can see it on their face where they they realize like this isn't working, it isn't getting anywhere for me, and then it almost turns into like a fake cry or fake thing, yeah. and, then, and then you're like, okay, are you are you done now? It's so, like, bro. It's so it's yeah. so similar when they get older because like your your older kid will convince you that this is the end of the world, and it may last a couple days. It may be a freak out that lasts. A few days, and then it's over. Mm -hmm. You just got to weather the storm, and then it you're is. fine. It's a lot of weathering, uh, yeah. Because in the moment, you're like, "Oh my god, what is happening?" I here? mean, I, I imagine it, again, very similar to that at a little young age, all the way up to teenagers. That a, a part of them is it, that's in their nature to test you that way. Yeah. It's all testing. It is testing. Where's you. the line? Yeah, want to know where? Where's the line? Can I get away with this? Does this did, work? Did it's you, all like subconsciously, you know, there that's happening, whether did, you know it or not. Did you guys know that? Uh, and this is red. It's actually registered this way. Um, a form of neglect for a child is to not have boundaries. Do you guys know mm -hmm. that? Not having boundaries, oh, yeah. not giving them a bedtime, 100%. not telling them do this, don't do that. Most kids will perceive actually, that as not love. They actually not being loved. They feel it. Yes, yeah. and they'll 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 be raised. Uh, they'll grow up with symptoms of neglect, yeah. even if the parent gave them love and was there, but just gave them no boundaries. They will actually have it's symptoms sad, of neglect. It's but I see that, you yeah. know, and especially, yeah, because, like, some some of their friends, you know, like, they're coming back from their dads or whatever, and it's like, 
you know, they, they didn't get any sleep. They're they're allowed to play video games all night. They're allowed yeah. to eat whatever they want, and they're just they just look like zombies. They're mm. just like just you know, and it's 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 frustrating. It's like kids they want that. They want structure. They want safety. They want to even know if they say consistency. They don't. Even, even if they say they don't. they don't have to say it. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps. Just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Speaking of parents, I got to talk about a super mom that I read about today. I don't know if she was a super mom, but just this alone makes me think she was a super mom. So this woman's name was Valentina Vasilieva, and she lived uh, between 1725 and 1765. You guys want to guess how many kids she had? <laughs> She's only 40 years old. I saw you. She went from up. 1725 to 17. It was like 50 something kids. Uh, uh, no, no, sorry. She was 76, but between 1725 and 1765, oh, okay, say, she had like, children. Okay, Those were her, her childbearing years. So 40 years of bearing yeah. children. Okay. You want to guess how many kids she had? 40. 69. Holy. What? 69 kids. From this was before one, fertility. The same treatment. lady. One woman. One woman. This is the world record what? for children. She had 16 pairs of twins. Oh my! Seven God. sets of triplets and four sets of quadruplets. Now, not all from the same man. Uh, I want to say it was. Really, sixty-seven of them survived infancy, so she lost two sets. She she lost a set of twins. Sixty-nine kids. Bro. Sixty. Okay, sixty-seven that survived. You imagine having sixty-seven kids. Dude, how how many months was she pregnant? What is that? Sixty-seven times nine months. That's how many years. Was she? Pre she was always pregnant. Dude. Always, always, yeah, yeah always be. She must have been so good at giving birth by that. You know what I mean? After like kid number ten. Oh, I'm like, sure oh, she did it while she was doing other things, yeah. doing doing stuff around yeah. the house. Cut the cord, ready. Hands it to the older yeah, kids. Yeah, yeah, Take yeah, care yeah, of your yeah, new yeah. Could you cut the cord real feed? quick? <laughs> yeah, can you cut the cord real quick? <laughs> can you guys feed the new one? Bro, yeah. Imagine being the oldest of that whole. Like you are like a general manager. So my my cut. I, I have a fam. One, one side of my family has a wow. lot. Like I have actually have people in my family that have uh, seventeen kids. Well, Oh, somebody uh, two, had 17? Yeah, yeah. Have same it, I, couple? Uh, yeah. And wow. they had they had, they had two sets of triplets in that, 17 kids. Um, it's interesting, too, because they're like, uh, like there's like uh, six cops, five nurses. Like, they have a lot of real similarities yeah. like that. And then I have my my other cousin, you know, Stephanie and them. They, yeah. have, they have six kids. Their mom had six kids. So the, it's interesting to watch. I've talked to them a lot about, like, having lots of kids and so that. She does make the argument that once you kind of break beyond the four, it actually, the the bigger number helps because the other ones end up helping because mm. they now have grown to an age where, especially if you've done a good job of making them self-sufficient yeah. and teaching them, which they have they have created that, that culture in their family really well. And so uh, she's like, yeah, no, actually, it, she goes one to three, I find, was some of the hardest. Four and beyond was easier because those ones now mm. that were the firstborns, you know, the first two yeah. that were born. Once you get to 45. Then, yeah. yeah. Like, are now, <laughs> are now <laughs> assisting and now are extra helping hands around the house, especially if you've built that culture in your house of we all support, we all help. And she's like, it's actually made the parenting part, of it, which logically doesn't make sense or it's a bit of counter to counter when you think about it. But it's like, okay, I get that. I've so, heard that from people. Yeah, I've heard that too. Yeah. Nowadays, what's considered a lot of kids? Probably three or more, right? It's kind of it's kind of feel. When I hear someone says had three kids, four yeah, kids. Once you like, oh, go you past three, it's yeah, it's kind of like yeah, four a full plus house. is a lot now. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, yeah when like, you hear more than four, it's like I you know what it is when you outgrow a car or a van. Once you as a family, once you outgrow yeah, a you vehicle, a, bus, a single vehicle. Like, yeah, when you oh need like because what's sixty nine kids a bus? What's a, work. what's a minivan? A minivan yeah, is like seven or eight touring bus. A minivan is like seven or seven, right? So that includes the parents, right? So that's five kids. So if you hit you hit five kids or more, and you're outgrowing a vehicle. I mean, you got your own little militia, dude. Like, bro, you got it. You, you have a team. company. You, can really, you have a company. You play a lot. You play a lot of sports. You know oh, what I'm saying? Like, hey, you know how many free employees that is? Trying to think yeah. about, yeah, what kind of business I'd run with that? <laughs> we make shoes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why are they so cheap? If that, hey, cheap. that's my my newest excitement with my son is that he might have like he might have that side to him. So I'm the what side? The, the business sales, like he may be that part might be oh, like that's the thing. The best. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. fact that we may not be that'll the, serve him best in the oh world. And, and i tell you what like i i tell you if if he, he wasn't gonna play basketball or do sports stuff that would probably be the other thing that would just like f fill my heart like where yeah. i'm like oh okay cool i could teach him that like there's something that you That's know awesome. not that i can't teach him other things just like you know i think every dad secretly or admittedly 
uh, would say. Of course, say you, you want you want something you like to th they, they like something yeah, that you like because yeah. yeah. then you can share relate that. easier. Yeah. No yeah. matter what, I will yeah. be the father that gets into whatever my son does. Mm. No matter how ridiculous it is, I will get into it. I, I know that I'm like that, but it would be really cool if it's something that I'm already. Yeah, into. right now, my, <laughs> with my four year old, he's like super into like uh, like science. He's and he comes up to me. I want to learn about and he'll give me a random thing like I want to learn about. Right now, it's Venus fly traps. Earlier, it was. Yeah. armadillos i went through a phase and i love that yeah i could do that all day long Fly traps that's cool ant farm oh yeah and then he's yeah, that's cool because he, i i feel like he's kind of transitioning right now because it was a lot of sports car stuff not that he's probably, probably he's still probably into that but now he's starting to move Ooh, that science. reminds me i'm going to start looking at combustion engines and stuff like that with him uh, yeah, that's great right. science for yeah. him to learn uh -huh. yeah no but he, he went up to my wife yesterday and he goes do you know how a venus flytrap closes and she's like no he goes uh water fills up some of the cells and it changes the the leaf and i said what are the words he didn't remember i was like oh i wish he remembered it, was, it was, goes from convex to concave uh, oh god if yeah, you remember that i know I, I try and you know because it's it's cool to know yeah, the, you know yeah. all that stuff i mean i i tell you what something that i don't think i knew as a dad until i became a dad that i think is is really neat to watch is even when your kids are like learning communication skills, they don't even know all the words. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. But the, the stuff that they retain is very fascinating. If they're into it's, it, they it, will. That's right. surprises me. It's very, like, that's why, like, I mean, I, we've really made it like an important, like, you know what? Like, I never shy away from, I. this is a, 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 a pact I've made with myself. I don't care how tired, irritable, short, I may feel. My son asked me a question, like, I don't ever want to default to the because dad said so or yeah. give him the lame answer. It's like, uh, it, and Katrina used to make fun of me. She's like, oh my God, you literally just explained. I'm like, yeah, you'd be surprised. And you then you start to you, see a sponge. him you retain it, it. Yeah. and understand it and then regurgitate something. You're like, oh shit, yeah. he like picked that up. That one time I told him that he picked up on it. Like, Jessica has been yeah. doing like religious studies with him too. You know, stuff that's appropriate for him. But he'll say things now. He'll do something and, or he'll, he won't do something. He'll come up to you like, the devil almost got me, dad. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> he almost got me, but I didn't do it. <laughs> All right. Not today, Satan. <laughs> yeah. Like, what? what are you doing? I love that kid. This morning I come out in the morning and again he woke up and snuck in and we heard him on the monitor. And you know, my wife's like, Oh, he's out of his room. I don't know where he's at. So I'm like, All right. Yeah. So I go downstairs and he's He's sneaking again. Yeah, again, he loves lollipops. He, he finds the hiding spots, and because we have lollipops for church, that's why keep, that's how we keep the kids sitting down for half of it. We never mm -hmm. do the full thing, but at least half. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's on his. He has a stool. And he pushes it around. And he's like climbing, and then I walk around. He sees me. and He sits down. I'm like, "What are you doing?" He goes, "Just sitting." <laughs> <laughs> so he just came out here to sit. Yeah. I'm like, okay. So I don't, you know, I don't uh -huh. call him out on it. I go, okay, that's cool. And then I wait for him to say it, and then sure enough, hey, can I have a lollipop? <laughs> yeah, you can have a lollipop. <laughs> Because I was going to take it anyway. Yeah, I know. that's what you're looking for, dude. <laughs> anyway, bro. Uh, hey, you know what? I, we missed the opportunity where we were talking about the GLP ones and trainers and like kind of their mindset. Like something that uh, I know that we're we're taking a lot of pride in right now of trying to do this, and it excites me. It reminds me. It gets my juices flowing the same way when we first built this podcast and there was five people listening. Right? It's like this whole movement into the trainer side and building that side of the business out and leading with this, hey, we're going to go out there and we're going to deliver on these, you know, free one hour webinars and we're going to do these it. These are classes. Yeah. Adam and I are doing classes and we're teaching trainers and coaches how to be successful. Every single one is a different topic. We just did one on how to consistently make six figures a year so you can build a career as a trainer. We're doing another one. Uh, when's the next one, Doug? If you, do you know the date? Yes, it's November 12th. November 12th. What's the title of that the one? The key for personal trainers to retain clients during the holiday season. There you go. Yeah. That's going to be what we're going to talk about. And so, and I, we're going to do them every other month for as long as we can. Yeah. And, so and they're, the, they're free. The key is to get on the uh, personal trainer growth secrets uh, on the Facebook page and follow the mind pump trainer page. And again, just like we started the podcast, the idea I, uh, for us, it's like, can we go out there and make a huge impact on that space by providing incredibly free, valuable stuff and then al allow the business to unfold from there. And so I think this has been a really cool focus. I've, the feedback's been incredible, but I know we want to make this a thing. So if you're a fitness manager, a gym owner, and you want your trainers to get free training uh, on how to be better coaches, trainers, scale their business, it's only going to impact your business and help you. 
get them in there. I want to make that a thing where we start to grow it just like the podcast. Oh, so you can actually too. sign up now. Oh, you can. At trainerwebinar.com. Oh, thanks, well, though. Trainerwebinar.com. Sign up. I love it, man. It reminds yeah. me of running gyms. That's how I get that same feeling. That old feeling that, you know? Yeah. I did too. I like the troops. Oh, yeah. This I'm excited more about this. I mean, I, I was an okay trainer, you know? I was an okay trainer. I was better at helping trainers. You were better than okay. Shut up. Yeah. You, were, <laughs> you were good. <laughs> yeah, no, he, he sat down. He did a good it. job, though. I yeah. know. It's like, now, when people train uh, with him, like, you're better than okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so That's actually a, hey, by the way, really this is a trainer, yeah, by the way, it. thing that we teach yeah. under promise, over deliver. That's, That's, That's it. the under promise part. That is my MO. Kyle, I'll figure it out. I don't know what I'm doing here. That's how I got Katrina. I'm okay in bed. I kind of suck. Yeah. It's like actually you're you're better than okay. Yeah, it works. It works. <laughs> I'm telling you guys. I'm telling you guys. No, hey, we Surprising. were we were talking earlier about having kids and stuff. Uh, one of the sponsors we work with, Joy Mode, has a testosterone. It's 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 promoted as a testosterone boosting supplement. By the way, the ingredients in it, the form of ashwagandha in there, KSM six six. This is the form of ashwagandha that's been shown to raise testosterone. But they also have some nutrients that, in many cases, if a man's not producing enough testosterone. They're low on some of these key nutrients like boron, which it's not easy to find. That's in there as well. Zinc is in there. Yeah, where do you get boron otherwise? It's yeah, not in a lot foods, of multivitamins. Doug, at one point you were chasing boron. Do you remember what foods you were trying to eat? Well, I actually have been taking supplements for quite a while on, okay. on boron. But, um, I mean, borax is made out of boron. Yeah, but you don't want to eat borax. <laughs> no, of course not. I'm just saying. I don't know where it comes from, though. Is what it is a borax? mineral? Put, put, it is. It's a trace mineral. Look up uh, food sources of boron. It's what a trace is borax? Mineral. Borax, it does use it's that clean For things. laundry. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's you, a powder. Yeah, it's not when Doug was a kid, you see laundry detergent. <laughs> it yeah, boosted my uh, <laughs> testosterone. That's a why lot. testosterone's so high, baby. <laughs> <It's> flowery <laughs> breath. Yeah. Holy yeah, shit! So yeah, see what food benefit. sources you get. Born. I think like shellfish. If I'm not mistaken, I remember looking this up with you at one point. Uh, so fruits and fruit juices, prunes, raisins, peaches, grape juice, all good sources. Avocados, mm -hmm. nuts. You'd Peanuts to, in particular. You have to eat a lot of those things yeah. though to get efficacious yeah. doses. Uh, yeah, a lot. You know, speaking of, but I got I got to say, I want real quick before I forget. So uh, the same ingredients that are in there to boost testosterone also boost fertility. I went on and looked up the reviews from people, uh -huh. and the reviews are like really good reviews. Like usually, test boosting quote unquote supplements have terrible reviews because they uh -huh. don't work. This has incredible reviews. Like the majority of them were five star. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I actually used it for the sex. You use it for like a pre-workout. Oh, you're talking about their other one, the oh, pre-sex. Oh, that's not the same no, thing. No, they have two, right? So they have one that oh. is for sexual performance. Essentially, it's a nitric oxide oh, one booster. One more of a test boost, yeah. Then they have one that raises testosterone. Oh, yeah. I haven't tried that one then. Yeah, that, yeah that's got great ingredients. The, 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 the nitric oxide boosting one I use all the time. I use that pre-workout. Now, is it is there any benefit to someone like me who's taking synthetic hormones? Or this is somebody who's it's more beneficial for somebody who's natural. The if you're low in boron, yes. If if you want the uh, the um, uh, adaptogenic properties of ashwagandha, yes. So in other words, you could be on testosterone. You're not going to raise testosterone by taking those things because you're on synthetic. Yeah, but ashwagandha is something I would take. You would take I, that I anyway. Have ashwagandha just to recover bag. faster. So yeah. ashwagandha is one of the few adaptogens that has legit studies on it that show that it increases athletic performance. So whether whether or not it raises testosterone, you'll probably notice an improvement in athletic performance from, mm. from taking something you like know, that. You know, you brought up uh, nuts, seeds, and all these things that and it actually made, reminded me of something that I wanted to bring up on the show. As I'm going through this whole documenting this journey and stuff, um, you know, I've reached the, the point now where I'm starting to uh, track even more diligently and one of the one of the 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 processes of that for me is, you know, first it's like you know, okay, I'm just paying attention to what I'm eating, I'm guesstimating, putting things in. Okay, now I'm um, I'm starting to weigh, especially weigh things that I do consistently. Like I, I, you guys have probably seen, almost every night I eat this like Greek yogurt, nuts and seeds, and berry bowl, mm -hmm. and. One, you've heard me talk about that FDA allows food labels to be off by 20%, right? And if you don't think that food labels and- What a crazy and, margin of error. And huge. <laughs> huge. 20%. And, and I wish so, they could be off 20% yeah. when my but people taxes, need to. This is, why I wanted to, are, this is why I wanted to talk about this. They need to wrap their brain around this. This is why eating out is really hard to be successful on, or it's really hard- to be successful with your uh, losing body fat, building muscle when you're eating out a lot because 20% is just what the FDA allows nutrient facts to be off. That doesn't factor in how Susie and Tommy and Timmy scoop the meat and the rice and the beans and the... 
so the there's human all, error. There's yeah. human error that, that they don't have. That FDA does not force them you to be accountable for. That in. If you don't think that there's a difference between the kid who scoops on Tuesdays and Fridays, you're silly. Of course there is. I know you who is at Chipotle. Chipotle? Yeah. That's right. Thank and, you. And I go so, to the good guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and everybody knows this. The heavy right? handed one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're if you're going online Mike. and you're just going like, oh, I had this protein bowl here or this poke bowl here, but and this hit me home because I had a poke bowl the other day. I'm like, that is definitely not that many ounces. That is way more than that, right? Yeah. So if you're eating out, you have the 20% error that FDA allows, then you have the scooping error, and then you have your own error and your own stuff, right? So uh I was eyeballing the the nuts and seeds that I was pouring on there for a while. And I was like, now luckily I've been doing this long enough that I, I'm a pretty good guesser, although I'm never precise. And so I'm like, let me measure out what a quarter cup truly is. And the point I was making on, on my story last night was that this nuts and seeds can really get away from you. And they're, you, they're, when you read the labels on them, they're normally like very small portion size because they don't want to freak you out. It's like five almonds. Right yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It is. Yes. I'm not exactly yes. Right. Like, so nuts, I've never eaten just nuts five and almonds. seeds are so high I in fat, fat and calories. And it's good fat and calories. Okay. So this is not a good or a bad thing. It's just that if you're tracking and you think just ha doing a handful of nuts and you're like, oh, that's probably this, like you probably need to track and figure out exactly what you consistently do because you're talking about two or 300 calories you could be off there. You're talking about the 20 to 30% that could be off from lab food labels. There's another two to 300 calories right there. And then human air, another two, like you're talking about being off by 800 to a thousand calories. Yeah. You could easily be off in a day. And this explains a lot of times the people who think they're eating so well or they're hitting their calories and they're just not. They're just, yeah. you're way off on your estimation on this and getting a hold of that. This is why too, as I go through this journey, there's, there's levels of discipline on what I will allow myself to do. And early on, I allow a lot of, you know, eating out meals throughout the week. Just uh, as long as I make good choices, have a good guesstimation, eh, the north of two or 300 calories. But as I start to tighten up, and I really try and lean yeah, out. You're not and, gonna risk it. Yeah, I can't. I just can't. Like it's too. It, it, doing that one meal out a day is too much of a variable when I'm really trying to carve carve down that. Now, right now, I can do it, but once you start getting leaner and leaner and leaner, eventually you get to a place where no, I gotta I gotta be managing everything to get to that next level. But it starts with just yeah. becoming aware of some of these things that you do regularly in your in your routine, and just like you know what, maybe this one time I'm gonna measure just to get it. A quick check on what what I'm what I'm actually into. Justin says, "Would you say you get fat off peanut butter all the time?" Fat off peanut butter. <laughs> Bro, that's it. Gets me, dude. Yeah. That's you ever taken a, a tablespoon of peanut butter? A real, like, table a real tablespoon is that little circle that's about this crazy. big. Yeah, nobody does that. No, everybody no. does this. No big. Yeah, <laughs> it's like four tablespoons, yeah. dude. Yeah. Like what most people scoop like as a tablespoon is like four tablespoons of peanut butter. And let me tell you, that's quickly getting up there in calories. Dude, have you guys recently had, speaking of peanut butter, have you recently had the, the fake like Skippy peanut butter? Because like, we don't do that. We do like the real all natural oh, yeah, oil like separate. The processed it. version of it, it. It's candy. Yeah, it's it so good. It's yeah. literally candy. They yeah. made it so palatable. And I forget, right? Because we have oh, yeah, the natural back stuff. back to the crappy one you get a stir for I like a million that, years. Dude. I get so. oil everywhere all the yeah, time. It's such a pain in the butt. Yeah. But the Skippy, that's Skippy, <laughs> that's, dude. that's candy. It is like engineered that one. That is so good. like Candy. That was one of my staple uh, you know, ways of bumping calories when I was a kid. I could just sit there and eat peanut butter. Like I could do this all day long. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. oh yeah, real quick. And then for some reason, I thought it was high protein. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem. People say, "Oh, peanut butter is high protein." No, it's not. No, it's not. It's high fat, high calorie. You know, yeah. pretty much. Pro you know how, many, how many how much peanut butter you need to eat to get thirty grams of protein? Well, it's insane. Yeah, and you know how many calories come <laughs> like with that? Five thousand. Yeah, calories. like four thousand <laughs> calories comes with your thirty grams of protein. Like, good job there, guy. <laughs> now, can you look up how many how many tablespoons of how much protein is in a tablespoon of peanut butter? And I will just do the math right now. I for think people. it's four in want, one tablespoon. In a tablespoon. So thirty grams would be like. I want to say four. I'm oh guess. my god, that's me guessing. You think so? It's been a while since. You're I've the only. Yeah, you probably know. What is? Yeah, it? you're right. Four. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Adam knows. Uh, look at that. Uh, there you go, bro. Nailed it. You're on the you're on point. Dude, I'm right good now. at something. You know, you're good on good. <laughs> All this <laughs> you're self depreciating no stuff. Yeah, yeah, Where's yeah. Adam? I'm setting the table. Here. <laughs> set the table. Good calories. I gotta go. You know what I'm saying? If I stay cocky all the time, yeah. like I gotta, see, I just gotta go the other way for a yeah, little that's bit. A good, that's a good Very strategy. humble. It's a humble I, side, know, Adam. <laughs> before we do a shout out, I want to hear about the Antarctica. Like, there's like an Antarctica note up there, yeah. Justin. Well, I know you know Antarctica facts are going to be for me. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's a given. Yeah, yeah. So there was a uh, discovery, I guess, a couple of years ago that I didn't know about. 
they like these scientists there had actually found a brand new species, like all the way, like is I, I forget like how deep it was, it was, like the deepest part of Antarctica that they drilled down, and it was like this weird looking. Um, it it basically is like a sea cucumber. Is, I guess they attribute it in that kind of family, but it was like so alien looking and like this like little like. Uh, uh, I don't know, almost like a, uh, what do you call it? Fleshlight. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Dude. Oh, I found a new species of fleshlight. Yeah, but it had like these weird, I wish we could put a picture up there. So <laughs> I, it's like hard for me to describe it without looking at it. But Doug, look up Antarctica fleshlight. It's like, uh, <laughs> no, it's, uh, yeah, it was like, really creepy. It was like very alien looking. And uh, anyways, I'm like, it. this this scientist is holding it with her hands. They've never... What always trips me out is when you find a brand new species and you just handle it with your bare skin. Like you yeah. don't, you don't know what, like it ex is excreting anything like, like what kind of like neurotoxins or like, they're just like, Ooh, look he's got new. weird, some weird disease. No, it's, it's something it's, weird. It's going to yeah. sound like a stupid question here, but it's, is, what is the reason what makes Antarctica so fascinating with this? Is it because it's been frozen for so long that it's preserved stuff much longer than anywhere else? You're also else not allowed to go there. Yeah, and like... It's the most... They it's really have laws. They will not allow people to go in there unless you're like a specific type of person. Why? Right. Just, that's the big... That's, that's the big... The, now, like they a, say it's because it's dangerous, question. but they say, yeah, the theory is that there's they're hiding things in Antarctica. They found things in Antarctica. This is what the conspiracy theorists say. That they don't want anybody there's, there's to know. So we, can't just, we can't just get on a boat and head over there? No. No. Nobody yeah. will take you there. Is there, what, is there somebody that's, oh, no one will even take us No, there. it's illegal. There are, yeah, they have you, like military or you have to be in the military or a scientist. And then you have to, that's how you like make you your approval. way there. Yeah. And you can that's go to why specific so, bases. Like, it, again, yeah, it's it's ripe for questions. You're not even allowed. Now, is this true, Justin? I, I thought I heard that you can't even go use Google Earth to look at Antarctica. They'll blur out or block out. That might be true now. Big I mean, a lot of, of people it. have been doing That's that. Weird. Yeah, because there's supposed to like a like a pyramid there, or like some <laughs> some weird ancient. <laughs> They've had yeah like satellite images of like pyramidal structures for sure. Mm. Yeah. And what what are year? I mean, do we even know what year round weather conditions are like there? What's it like? I how think it's always cold. I mean, oh. obviously, it's just, <laughs> I didn't need you. To I was like, are you really well, asking I, a no, question? <laughs> was it called I, the Van Nuys Belt? I, yeah. um, so the, technically. Uh, if we were to 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 be able to get out past you know this um, radiation belt, like we should have been launching from Antarctica, that would have been our best like oh to trajectory go, to go to like to get out way like in pet. deep space. Mm. But uh, why Sasquatch? Why? Yeah, that's okay. probably what Sasquatch, it is. Sasquatch. Thank you. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You could never find you couldn't find the flashlight, huh? I look for it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll send it later. Not really. Yeah. <laughs> Doug pulls it up. Your delivery will be here. Yeah, huh? yeah, 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 Quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Switch out real quick. What is that? Dude? Uh shout out. Uh our our buddy Doug Bobst uh did interviews with uh Sal and I. What's the name of his podcast? It's called oh, Adversity. Oh, the, the Adversity Advantage. Advantage. Adversity yeah. Advantage. So yes. shout out to Doug. Um he was actually in studio when he did that. It's on YouTube. Uh, at least I, is yours up too or just mine? Mine's up too. Okay, both yeah. of ours are up. Mm -hmm. So go out there, watch mine. So mine does better than Sal's. We were secretly competitive about that <laughs> stuff. <so. laughs> it all comes back here. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> it's good stuff. Most children's multivitamins are just candy with very few nutrients. Well, there's a company called Haya that is different. This has efficacious doses of nutrients that children need. It's also flavored with monk fruit. So it's no sugar, no artificial sweeteners. It's a multivitamin your kid will love to eat, but it also has the nutrients that you want your child to consume and utilize. Go check them out. Go to HayaHealth.com. That's H-I-Y-A Health.com forward slash mind pump. And on that link, you'll get 50% off your first order. All right, back to the show. Our first caller is Jordan from California. What's up, Jordan? What's happening, dude? How can we help you? How's it going, guys? Good, man. What's going on? Um, well, first, thank you um, for everything. Um, with this intro, I just want to say I have a, a, a love connection with all of you guys. Doug, we both love the Japanese culture. Uh, Justin, we love mosh pits as older men. And yes. then Adam, our uh, love for sports. And then Sal, I couldn't think of anything, but we do love our wife. No, I'm just kidding. We love, <laughs> <laughs> we love say anchovies or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll just uh, jump right in. Um, Thanks to ChatGPT, I've updated my question to try to be efficient with it. Uh, <laughs> so I'm currently five foot eight, 214 pounds, fluctuating around 20% body fat. 
I aim to reduce my body fat to 13 to 15% while maintaining my current eating habits where I consume about 3000 calories daily, hitting at least 200 grams of protein. Um, my current training regimen is about three days a week, two to three days a week, uh, with strength training, mainly, uh, maps anabolic. So the update that I put in is, um, I was playing hockey and pickleball once a week, but now, um, I've reduced that due to injuries. And then I've noticed that my frequency and recovery times of injuries has also increased as well. Um, and then lastly, I finally got my testosterone, uh, testosterone results back from Equalife and I scored low two years ago. Um, it was 297 and theirs is a little different in how they score theirs, but, um, I'm low on both of those. So my question is to you, considering these changes and challenges, is it possible to adjust my training protocol to sufficiently boost my metabolism to reach my body fat goals? So you want to get leaner without changing your diet, but you're also working with low testosterone? Yes. And uh, one more thing is uh, we've been battling infertility. So TRT has been something I wanted to do, but I've been told that um, due to us not being able to get pregnant, that's probably not something we should prioritize or I should prioritize. No, but there are other ways of boosting testosterone with medical interventions. Like HCG or something? That well. will boost uh, fertility or sperm count. So like HCG and clomiphene are both used uh, sometimes in men to boost sperm count. They'll both also raise your testosterone. It's going to be really hard. Uh, I mean, unless you're overtrained, um, you know, we can look at that. But it's going to be really hard to get leaner with that, with that by just changing your routine um, and not changing your diet and being in the low range with testosterone. You're not in a bad place, right? You're sitting at you're around, what, 18% body fat, you said? Um, closer to 20. I took Ever since I took off pickleball and hockey consistently and reduced my training, because I was running um, MAPS, anabolic performance and aesthetics, and I just felt my joints getting really sore. So I, I reduced the load and really focused on more range of motion, getting good form, um, and... That helped a little bit. And then once I got back into hockey, I sprained my MCL, both of them. And if you just noticed, like I just, my knees were fine and I played pickleball again the other day um, at 32. I feel like I shouldn't be uh, feeling the achiness so early on. Yeah. One of the signs of lower, of lower yeah, testosterone. Low testosterone yeah. stuff. Yeah. You're not, like Sal said, you're not in a, in a bad place. I, I like, I would love for you to get on the phone with Transcend. So over at MP Hormones, our, our, our partners over there. And, and tell them what we told you as far as like an HCG. I think HCG, which is only going to promote uh, you or give you a better op better chance of getting pregnant. So it's going to support what you want to do there. It also could give you just the boost you need to get your, your testosterone naturally back up to give you a little bit of momentum so you can build some muscle at that calorie range and what you're doing. And then that actually will only snowball and get better for you because once you start, there's a lot of research to show that when you get lower than 15% body fat, many times if we're over 15% body fat, your your testosterone levels will be su uh, uh, suppressed a little bit and then getting a little bit leaner will automatically help that also. So the combination of the HCG with you strength training like you are right now and then getting you down to 15 or lower. Now, I think to change good. programs, I would go symmetry. Just because you, you, you mentioned MCL injuries, I mm -hmm. like symmetry. It's unilateral. Uh, uh, you know, Most of it's unilateral. I think that'd be a great workout. Yeah. Aesthetic is way too much volume. I wouldn't do that, especially without uh, testosterone levels being the high range. Uh, but I like symmetry. I would go symmetry, follow that program, um, and stay where you're at or cut your calories a little bit. You know, 300-calorie deficit – or drop from where you're at, you would you probably would see a slow loss in body fat um, as a result. Or keep it where it's at, follow symmetry, and, and and again work with those hormone experts and see if you can raise your testosterone levels with the non-testosterone uh, intervention. Which, by the way, okay, I'm not a doc. None of us are doctors here, okay. But uh, you, lots of men on TRT also can uh, produce children, and the the way they do that is they combine their TRT with HCG. HCG uh, is, is, a, is a mimic for luteinizing hormone, and it tells the body to produce more sperm and uh, more testosterone itself. So when you see a man on TRT who has kids, that's why. What he did was he took HCG and then had a uh, had a kid. <clears throat> not to get yeah. not to get too personal into your sex life either, but when you also have increased testosterone like that, the volume of sex you're probably going to have is going to be higher than what it currently is too. I don't know where it's at right now, but when, you're, when your testosterone goes up, typically so does your sex drive. 
And if you're so, if you're taking something like ACGs and your goal is to get your wife pregnant right now, I think that actually absolutely could support you. Again, we're not doctors. I'm not here to tell you what to do or whatever, but this was actually kind of where I was at very similar, even numbers. And, uh, Katrina and I got pregnant while I was taking testosterone and HCG. So it's very, very much so. My wife um, got pregnant on accident when I was on testosterone. It's the yeah. Same thing though. I was taking HCG. So yeah. So that absolutely. I'm, I'm curious about the the three thousand calories. Like um, it says, you only track protein, and so, I mean, how's the diet? Because it could be something really simple by just kind of tightening up a little bit of the diet too. Like, do you eat out a lot? I mean, do you have like bad habits of like snacking foods? Like, what's it look like? No, we typically eat most foods. I cook a lot from home. Um, so most of our meals are home cooked. My wife is trying to do a lot of detoxing with her body. So we do a lot of dairy free, sugar free, okay, good. um, low inflammation diet. So it does incorporate a lot of whole foods, uh, from time to time we do eat out. So I know the, when I was tracking, um, 3000 was kind of on the higher side of what I was targeting. So I kind of gave more so, more so a buffer of what I was shooting for okay. um, and then trying to kind of adjust it according to my activity. So when I was more active, I would try to incorporate more food. Yeah. How long have we? Been, how long has it been that you've cut out all the uh, sports and stuff like that and you're just focusing on the training? How long has that been? Um, it started earlier this year. April's the first injury that I had. Um, I kind of worked on rehabbing it back and then – just recently the um the knees has been kind of going out i noticed because i've been also trying to optimize sleep at least seven hours uh ashwagandha magnesium doing all those things um and <laughs> as people say old i know it's not old age but um just injuries have been happening like waking up with neck pain that lasted six weeks and um like after pickleball i felt fine on friday but waking up saturday it, it started aching again so i reduced the activity about six months ago, I'd say, um, to really focus more on recovery and sleep. Okay. Cause I was training at 5.00 AM. Um, so I wanted to try to get in more sleep, more consistent sleep. Mm -hmm. Um, so I switched my training to later in the day. A, a lot of this sounds, uh, yeah. testosterone related. Yeah. So it's, yeah definitely that's very, very, not. those are very common symptoms of being in the low, low range, like we can't recover energy, <clears throat> uh, kind of aches and pains. And you also sound like you're doing a lot of the right yeah. things to get it up naturally. So this is an example of where, you know, I would, you know, a family friend yeah, of mine, with, I would sense. say, Hey, listen, this, you know, cause I typically, if a family member or friend comes to me, uh, especially if they're under the age of 40, even though, you know, 30, you're not like a spring chicken anymore. I still would say, Hey, let's see what we can do with sleep and your regimen, your training, your diet. Let's try and adjust all that. Let's see if we can see you get boosts up. If you're still testing low after that, this is where I would send even my family friends to like, okay, now let's go get some intervention. And I would start with HCG before I just went right to testosterone because maybe that'll just kickstart it and well, then you'll snowball. Yeah. Just listen to what they say. Cause yeah. they'll give you some suggestions. Okay, awesome. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Got you got it, man. I'm going to send you symmetry, okay? Yeah, symmetry would be good for you, dude. Uh, I got symmetry. I got uh, RGB symmetry 15 in anywhere. Oh, so. you're set. That's oh, actually yeah. the next one I'd say is 15, I think would be a really oh, good yeah. fit too. So do symmetry because of the injury stuff you're dealing with. But then I think you actually think MAPS 15 would be a good problem for you, program for you. Perfect. I'll do that. Thank you, guys. Thanks, All right, Jordan. Jordan. Right on. Appreciate it. A lot of what he's describing are signs of low testosterone. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Totally. I mean, I, I, you know, it's so tough. I know that we have to, we're not doctors. It's not our place to, yeah. <laughs> you know, tell yeah. people what to do in this case. But here's an example of just like, man, if this yeah. was me, like that's right away, I'm going to get that testosterone level up. And I think it actually solves a lot of and these we, problems. And we've adjustments though, this training and, you know, nutrition and sleep and all these factors. Like it just does, it sounds like he's really, he, he's moved in the right direction. It's just like, you know, there's that added element. Yeah, uh, ashwagandha, magnesium. One yeah. thing maybe we didn't ask about was vitamin D, maybe vitamin, vitamin D. Vitamin D yeah. maybe. Well, I mean, we talked with, uh, you know, hormone experts. We've had some on the show. And it is a myth that you can't get pregnant while on testosterone. You just have to add other uh, interventions to get your sperm count up. But again, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an example of that. We weren't even trying for my daughter and we got pregnant. And that's because I was on HCG while I was on the testosterone. Why are you bragging so much? I know. <laughs> Our next caller is Christian from California. What's up, what Christian? Up? What's up, man? How's What's it going? What's up, guys? In, in, hey, this in, is in Iggy, Jersey, bro. You got good taste there. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm a little heartbroken about Clay, though. Yeah, I have, I have a lot of thoughts around that. It was his time, bro. 
It was his time. I think so too. He did. He did us. He did well for us for a long time. But it was time. You're right. You're right. How do I help you, man? Yeah, man. Um, I just want to say thanks to you guys for um, all of the content that you put out, and especially just letting us listeners into your personal lives. That's been super cool for me. Um, Sal, particularly for you, man, to just hear your faith journey in all of this has been so sweet. Thank you. Um, I used to be, I used to work in ministry and I have a Bible degree, worship leader. And so to hear things like the, like Phil Wickham concert and just hearing the whole sanctification process for you has been really awesome. And I'm just so thankful that God has opened your eyes to the gospel and all of that has been sweet. Um, So I've been listening to you guys since last year, like October-ish. And and I just also, I just want to say this one's for your listeners. This is for free. If you're listening and you're thinking about doing a maps program, this is your sign to just go do it. <laughs> like, honestly, it's almost like these guys know what they're talking about. <laughs> Get a program. Wait for it to go on sale. I got all of mine on Black Friday last year. <laughs> and it was a steal. But just or try right it. Now. Just yeah. do it. <laughs> um, so my questions, I have a couple here. The first one, you guys talk a lot about um, how body weight and like the scale isn't a really good metric to track. Um, and so I don't have a target body weight. I have a target body fat percentage. I think right now I'm sitting at like 20, 23, four ish. I'd like to be at, I don't know, like 17. Um, so if I don't have a target body weight, how do I pick a protein target? If we're trying to do one gram of protein per pound of target body weight when i'm on a reverse like i pick kind of arbitrary numbers and i'm gonna reverse i'm aiming for like 190 when i'm gonna cut it's like 160 ish but i don't know if it matters all that much so how do we pick protein targets if we don't have a target body weight that's a great question uh what's so your current body weight what is it at right now as of this morning is like 182 182 and you're sitting would you say 23 percent body fat I think around there, I don't have, I haven't done like a DEXA scan or any, we don't have that stuff around okay. me. 165 but, uh, to 170. Yep. 165, 170. So typically number. what you would do is you take your body weight uh, and you would figure out, okay, if I was at 17% body fat with the same lean body mass, what would my weight be? Okay. So you you take your current body weight, let's say it's 23% body fat, multiply it by 23. There's your fat mass. And then if I got down to 17%, what would that bring my weight down? And it's probably around what Adam said, 165, 170. So I think that's a good target uh, to hit with uh, grams of protein. And what's the, what's the good part about how we always recommend you guys just one gram to the whatever that you know, goal weight is, is that it's enough that it's going to cover the buffer if we're off by you know five or 10 pounds. It's, not, it's close enough that you're going to be getting uh, enough protein and some that that's why it's such a good target and that's why it's not that big of a deal if like oh if you were down if you hit one if i tell you 165 170 is what we should target and you hit 158 i mean you're going to be okay because you're still getting what the body needs you know optimal would be that one to one but it's yeah it, it's you're you're good enough if you're hitting right around that 165 170 yep. based off of what sal was saying gotcha that makes sense and if hypothetically not hypothetically because i've done this but say I like my morning, I like skip breakfast or I miss breakfast or my breakfast is real low on protein and I'm behind at the end of the day. Is it better to hit my calorie goal or hit the protein goal? Protein. Protein, especially if you're trying to get leaner. Yes. Protein. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Cool. That's super helpful. The second part of my question, um, you guys have talked about undulating calories before and I think the way that I understand it is instead of looking at your whether surplus or deficit daily, looking at it at like a at like a weekly goal instead. So instead of being at like a 500 deficit every day, just looking at during the week, at the end of the week, being at a 3,500 deficit. Yeah. Yes. Uh, within reason, right? So, so you know, you wouldn't want to do like a 3,500 calorie deficit in a, in a day. In a day. Yeah, right. whatever that would look like. Yeah. No, but it'd be something like some days are 500, some days are 1,000, some days are none. Um, right. Some days are up a little bit, but overall, yeah. And and there's some, there's some value to it. Most of it being psychological. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if I were to do, I haven't tried it yet, but if I do that, do you undulate 
like protein also? No. Or does that stay no. the same? Keep that. The that's week? the one thing you remain consistent. Yeah. You okay. be consistent with hitting that protein target. Allow the carbs, fat, and calories to manipulate up and down throughout the week. Yeah. So protein, um, you don't really, our body doesn't have a good storage mechanism for protein like it does for fat and carbohydrates. And the data on it shows that a consistent protein intake is best for muscle and fat loss. That being said, okay, there's another side to that coin, which is potential psychological break or giving your gut a break. So if you're eating tons of protein all the time and you feel like I need to give my gut a break, you're not going to, it's not like you're going to set yourself back tremendously by having one low protein day uh, or even fasting a, a whole day. Um, so you want to balance it all out, right? Um, some people, I've worked with clients where we underlay protein as well. Not mo most, most we don't, but some I did just for the break in it all, you know, like, oh my God, I mean so much protein. It's real hard for me. All right, let's have a couple, two, let's, let's have a couple low protein days just to give you a little mental break uh, type of deal. But, you know, from a gains perspective and what the data says, uh, consistent, you want to say consistent. So if you do take one of those breaks or a low protein day, do you try to make that up the no. next day or you just go back to whatever it was? No, you go back to wherever you were. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Cool. That's. Do we hit them all, Christian? I think so. Do I have time for a quick, another one? Yeah, you do, bro. <laughs> ahead, bro. What's up? Great. Just a quick programming one. So we, um, so right now we have a, we have a four and a half year old. So right between our alias and Max, so hearing all of your guys' stories about that have been hitting close to home. They've been great. <laughs> Um, but we have another one on the way due in November. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and so I, so I've kind of, I've planned out my programming, I think. So I started on anabolic in January. So I did anabolic and then performance and then aesthetic right now I'm in phase two of symmetry. And I think that's going to take me to baby's due date. And once baby comes, I'm expecting no sleep. Maps yeah. 15, bro. Maps 15. Yeah, I, I got Maps 15. Okay. That's my plan is to transition into that. Um, I'm thinking, so for my for my wife, postpartum, I know when she, whenever she like feels ready to start lifting again, before we had her on, she did like the first phase of Maps anywhere, I think. Um, I know it's got to be like super low volume. Should I put her on like maps 15 also map or starter. back on anywhere? Map starter. starter. Map starter. Yeah. It's perfect for starter. Her. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Now one, one thing that I'll advise if, if possible, Christian would be to also look at uh, postpartum pelvic floor therapy, um, work with a physical therapist. You can get some that'll come to your house um, because that makes a huge difference uh, for the obvious reasons, but also for the not so obvious, the pelvic floor musculature um, it, it all changes when you're having a, when you're pregnant and then have a baby and, and postpartum that the pelvic floor muscle imbalances contribute to core instability, back pain, hip pain, along with the common things that you hear with like, you know, you, you, you can't hold your pee and that kind of stuff, but it's really about activating your core because those muscles are, uh, they, they are important for stability as well. So I would look at like postpartum pelvic floor work. It's probably offered by your doctor or wherever hospital you go to. They probably have something like that. And then Starter. Starter's perfect postpartum. It's a perfect program. Gotcha. Cool. I don't have Starter yet. You do now. Uh, we'll send it to you. Thanks. How, how long is Starter? Is it? I think it's three months. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I think it's going to give you a good 90 days. Sweet. And then after Starter. Anabolic. Okay. Anabolic pre-phase. Mm -hmm. Cool. Awesome. That sounds great. Thank you guys. Yeah, so you much. got it, man. Great questions. And, and uh, congratulations on the, on the new baby coming. Yeah. Thank you so much. Good I'll see you guys later. Right, Appreciate Christian. it, brother. Thank you. Bye. Good questions. Yeah. Great questions yep. on the right track. Perfect. That's actually a good question. I'm surprised we haven't had that asked before. I've been asked that. Yeah. I, I mean, that right. was some I had clients ask me all the time. But yeah, I yeah. I mean, I just I actually went on the the by a touch a little bit of that on the the rant that I went on last night on Instagram. It's just uh, we we overcomplicate this and overthink mm -hmm. this. You know, it's like, and you know, you and we typically say, "What's your goal weight?" If you don't have a technical goal weight, I mean, if you have an idea of where yeah. that is, it's it's cl it's close enough. You know, what I'm saying like just the, get close to that. Yeah, in, in that range, the one, and that's why we like the one to one thing because this it's is easy. where it gets complicated yeah. when you have you know point six of lean body mass. You're pulling out a calculator every time your your body weight changes ten pounds. It's like yeah. 
ridiculous versus just saying, hey, where do you, where's your goal? Or just whatever your current <laughs> weight is and yeah. just, you know, get, you know, shed some fat. Hey, sorry to interrupt. It's October. MAPS Muscle Mommy is 50% off, half off. If you're interested, click on the link below. All right, back to the show. Our next caller is Carrie from Wisconsin. Hi, Carrie. Good morning. Hi, guys. How, How are, are you? you? Good. How are you? How are you doing? Good. Thanks for taking the call. I love all your content. My husband and I have learned so much. So thank you. Thank you. Awesome. All right. So I'll just kind of dive right in. Um, my question is around fat loss. And I've always heard that you can't spot train, but I was looking to see if there's any advice around balancing overall body fat for like upper body and lower body. Um, I've always been fairly lean, but anytime I put on any fat, like when I try to increase calories or things like that, it just goes straight to my lower body. And if I get my lower body to kind of look the way that I'd like it to, then my upper body looks too too lean, too frail. Um, so just kind of wondering if there's any advice there to kind of help make it look um, a little bit more balanced or, you know, anything that you think might help um, to not make it seem so focused on the lower body. What, what are we doing training wise? Tell me, are you following any MAPS programs right now? I'm not currently. I did try anabolic and I got injured. So I stopped. Um, but I've been for the last six to nine months or so doing a program where it's about three days of strength training. Um, it's a lower body day, upper body day, and like a full body day. And then some cardio, um, two or three other days a week, um, usually walking about 30 to 45 minutes a day with the dog. Okay. So here's how fat storage works. And what you'll often, often hear is it's genetic, right? You can't, there's nothing you can do to change where your body stores body fat. That's partially true. Okay. The other part of that, that people don't uh, talk about often, although you hear it more often now is that your hormone profile also plays a role in fat storage. And so what you tend to see, to give an example, if you were to take a man and put him on estrogen and block his testosterone, his fat storage would start to look more like a woman's. Yeah, more on the hips. Okay, you'd see a little bit more in the lower body, upper chest area, upper arm uh, versus the belly. Same thing with women. You put them on testosterone, block their estrogen, lower the estrogen, progesterone, and you'll start to see kind of male male pattern uh, fat storage. Um, so, so hormones do play a role. It's not a huge role, but they do play a role. Your, your best bet is this. You want to have a nice, balanced, youthful hormone profile. That's going to give you the, the best potential you have, whatever that is, for fat uh, distribution, Okay. Um, so, uh, I don't, so that, that would be the, that would be the next step. We would look at your hormone profile and take it from there. Now there's things you can do in your lifestyle that can optimize hormone profile, get enough rest, make sure you don't have any nutrient deficiencies, strength train properly. Don't overtrain. That's the most common mistake people who are really into fitness make is they just overtrain, which causes an imbalance between estrogen and progesterone, lowering of testosterone, growth hormone levels tend to be lowered. You see cortisol tend to be, uh, you know, not appropriate, meaning it's high at night versus in the morning type of deal. But that's where you want to look. There's a couple of ways you could do it. You could, you could work with a functional medicine practitioner, um, do like a Dutch test, see where your hormone profile is, and then work naturally to see if you can make it uh, or move it in a kind of favorable way. The other way is to do hormone replacement therapy. And there's some doctors that I really respect quite a bit, Dr. Tina being one of them, who's like hormone replacement therapy is, she feels like, everybody after a certain age would benefit from being on hormone replacement therapy. And that would, that would put, give you the most ideal chance of having a fat distribution that you would want, but it's still going to be within the realm of your genetics. In other words, mm -hmm. we're not going to be able to like radically change wherever your genetic uh, predisposition is. It would probably look more like your fat distribution did when you were in your 20s, or something like that. I, I also have a few more questions just because there might be some other ways that I could potentially help this too. Have you um, intentionally ever been on a, like a bulk? Have you ever tried to intentionally add calories and build? I did when I was actually trying the anabolic program yeah. and it just, everything went to the lower body and it wasn't, you know, the way that I wanted it to look. So it was a little bit, um, you know, it's the mental game yes. where you're trying to like push through that. I probably did not do it long enough. Um, so yeah, I, I have tried and I do think there's room to go up in terms of calories in my nutrition, but it, you know, it's, it's a little 
discouraging and um, hard I, to get through that initial bump. <laughs> I, I love that you answered that way because it, it, it leads me to believe what I was uh, like guessing, which is that you can, cause in there too, the, the, the listeners don't see this, but you also talked about, you know, anytime that you tend to gain weight, put on body fat, it goes right to the hips and you notice cellulite, these things right away. When I'd have clients like this, uh, convincing them that, Hey, we need to go on a bulk and I'm actually going to build your legs would always fuck with them psychologically. Cause there'd be like, Adam, that's the area I don't want to put any more weight. And I would say, but listen though, I promise you, we're going to build them and sculpt them. And so we need to go through this phase of almost being uncomfortable for a while where you actually, your pants get tighter and they get, they get bulkier for a minute. But what I'm doing is building muscle there, which is going to help with the whole cellulite thing that you have. Typically when you put on body fat and the, and the, it goes in the lower half and you see cellulite that normally that's because maybe you were overeating and not training, but with the intent of I'm going to go build muscle here and I'm going to be okay with a temporarily my legs maybe gaining a little bit of size because we're going to add muscle is going to help you metabolically. It is going to start to sculpt and shape the legs the way you want. Temporarily, it may feel like, oh God, we're getting more, we're getting thicker down there and I don't want that. But then what, once I get to a place calorie wise with you and I go, all right, Carrie, now we've been doing this for the next, for the last four to six weeks. Now I'm going to cut you and we're going to reduce calories. And then when you lean out, what you will notice is like, the shape of your legs now looks different than what it did before. And it won't have that cellulite feeling and look to it. It'll now have this more firm and shapely and tight and you'll love the legs, but it's getting through that mental hurdle of we probably should, you were probably doing the right things on anabolic, right? That, that's actually where I'd love for you to go is like, let's do a reverse diet. Let's follow a program like anabolic or muscle mommy. Something like that would be great for you. Uh, and just stay the course, trust the process. And then once we get to a point where you're, I don't know where you're at calories wise now, but I'd love to get you to a place where you're eating five, 600 more calories a day than you are now. So that I then can take those away from you after you've built muscle for four to six weeks and then trim you down and then reveal what the now, body now looks before, like. Now before, just before anybody tries to flame Adam about, you know, how making cellulite go away or whatever. What I mentioned about hormone balance, what Adam's talking about, especially with someone like you, would be how largely the strategy to get your hormones in a youthful place. I see in your question that you range between 15 to 18% body fat. Is that is that pretty much where you live? Okay. Yeah, I think the last time I got tested, it was the middle of August and I was at 17, okay. which was actually the highest I'd been in okay. a while, but I was deliberately trying to build that up um, in hopes of getting my hormones more in balance. Okay. Um, I've been working a little bit towards that too. Okay, so we hit the nail on the head. I have... I have almost never found a woman over the age of 25 who lives in the teens of body fat percentage and did not have hormone imbalances. It just doesn't, it just, I'd never seen that. To sit that lean for that long, you are, you are asking your hormones to be out of balance. You are telling your body it's not safe. You need to have, you need to live around 20 to 22% body fat for you to balance your, your hormones out. It's probably not going to happen sitting about 17%. So the advice Adam was giving was, was ideal. Talk to me about the hormone uh, um, imbalances that you noticed. What, what have you seen on your tests that are low or, or not where they need to be? Oh, I'm trying to remember the last time I got tested, it was, it wasn't a Dutch test, but it was some deeper like thyroid testing and everything. Okay. Um, it suggested either hyper or hyper, hyper or hypo thyroidism, like headed towards that direction, but not quite there. Um, but I've also been working just like in terms of like more resting, more sleeping. Um, I'm go, go, go all the time. Yeah. I've got two little kids working full time. So I just feel like my days are like, I've got everything on a schedule to get everything done. And I've been deliberately trying to like, just yeah. get myself to chill out a little bit, um, with some of those things. Um, but then also incorporating like some more nutrition, some more fat in my diet, things like that to help with the hormones too. But I haven't done any hormone replacement therapy or, you know, anything on that. End okay. Of the spectrum. So you have two paths here. Okay. I, I could have predicted this, by the way, I knew you were, you, you worked a lot and you, you, you go, go, go just based off your question. I'm like, okay, she's probably overdoing a lot of things. So there's two, two paths here. Okay. Path one is you keep going down this, let's bump the calories. Let's reduce our activity. Let's get less stress or whatever. The other option is a hormone replacement therapy, which will do it for you. And then you don't have to change a lot within your lifestyle. Now, and I hate saying that because it sounds like the easy route, uh, but it's just a reality for a lot of people. You might not be able to take more time off. You might not be able to rest more. You got two little kids. You got a full-time job. I mean, I don't know what your situation is. So hormone replacement therapy would kind of do it for you. 
but you'd still have to bump your calories. You'd still have to increase your calories. Otherwise, you got to go the other route, which is you got you got to chill a little bit with all the stuff you're doing and and, and let your body fat creep up. Uh, otherwise, your hormones are going to have a tough time balancing your hormones sitting at 17% body fat. It's going to be real difficult. The path you were heading with anabolic and reverse dieting was the right path. Yeah. That was the right. You just needed to see it through and get past the psychological piece. And I understand that. I know how hard that is, especially when it's going to an area that you already have like, oh God, you know what I'm saying? And then there, and then you're seeing, oh, my pants are fitting tighter. And then you want to go the other direction right away. And so- uh, but that's that is the that's the natural route to solve this problem is to do that. And even if you use that, it still is the route. So it's the route no matter what. But if you're going to still try this and not uh, get intervention, then I think that that's the the must go. Otherwise, definitely think we just did. A, who's the episode who just went up? She talks about this also. Doctor Estima. Did you listen to the episode today or yesterday? Doctor Stephanie Estima. You'll love that episode. I think I did. I think I started it. Yeah, just, I hadn't finished it yet. Yeah, just dropped. That's a really good episode for you to listen to too. So yeah, her and uh, Doctor Tina are I think for phenomenal doctors that that speak to this. Um, but yeah, that's that's the move. The move is to to reverse diet and to to stay the course. And if you go up a little bit of body fat percentage right now, it's you okay. You need to. You, yeah, you probably need to. It's a good thing. Um, and 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 just got it. You know, if you're not, are you in our private forum yet? I am not. No. Okay, I'm gonna have Doug put you in there, and then just check check in with us because I and, and just give us an update every month or so. Just letting us tag the guys and I, and just let us know what you're doing, how you're feeling, how things are going. That way, we can talk you off the ledge when you are wanting to reverse and go the other direction when you're doing a great job. So just make sure you check in with us. Thank you. Could I ask a, a part B then yes, to this sure. question? Sure. So if I'm going to go back to anabolic. Um, going from, you know, my current three days of strength training plus the three cardio, do I just dive right in to the three days of training and then the three days of rest? Or is there a way to like transition to Water. that type of program so that I'm not, I guess, um, I, I'm seeing huge change very quickly that would maybe deter me? Yeah, walk. So where you were doing cardio, that becomes walking for you now. And then uh, the programming, yes, yeah. go right into and maps anabolic. She's doing. I think she says she's walking her dog. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just go right maps anabolic, straight up phase one. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I will give that a try. Thank right. you. You got it. Thanks, right, Carrie. Okay. Bye. I had a feeling. Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's, uh, so people watching this right now, we've trained so many people that we can often look at someone, hear some of the questions, kind of predict. Uh, where they're at. And, you know, I've had many clients like this. And if you're a woman and you're sitting in the teens, especially if you're in your, you know, after the age of like 36, 37, you start to get closer to 40, mm -hmm. you're, it's gonna be hard to balance your hormones out. It just is, uh, in that, in that place. Now I've seen women with balanced hormones in that lean body fat, but they, they started out that way and they did it. They did it in a way that was very healthy. And, you know, and they also had some genetic predispositions to where it worked out that way, but very rare. Like, to sit at 15, 16, 17% body fat all the time yeah. and work full time and and then expect a balanced hormone Just profile. Just being in that calorie deficit Sucking. for so many years, you know, that's going to add up. Like so, it, it's no way you can really maintain like a solid balanced uh, hormone profile. Yeah, I hope she I hope she sticks with this. This is another example too. Um, I don't know where she's at, if she can do something like this, but this is where like a real good coach or trainer Yep. to kind of hold your hand through this process because the, the biggest challenge will be the psychological yeah. one, right? Will be she is used to maintaining herself at a very lean, lean place. And when you reverse diet someone like this and they and her weight goes to her legs, yep. I know that that's going to be the hardest part. Yeah. And this is where these clients, I would have to con continually talk them off the ledge and go, listen, you're doing good. You're doing a great right. job. We're doing what we need to do right now. Trust the process. Trust the process. But it's hard. I get it. Our next caller is Abe from Louisiana. What's up, Abe? What's going on, Abe? Sad hey. Man. Gentlemen, how's it going? Good. Pretty good, man. How can we help you? Is that a rainbow trout on your neck? Is that what that is? What is that? It, it's a redfish. Oh, shit. <laughs> it's a redfish, man. That's, like uh, you're that's, a, that's a first for me, bro. That's a first right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Adam, does, Adam knows his we, fish. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we, we have the redfish down here in the south, man. We don't do much uh, do not do much rainbow trout. But um, <laughs> but I've caught them. I've caught them. I caught a bunch of them up when I uh, lived in Alaska, man. I did a lot of lot of rainbow trout fishing up there. It's like uh, the opposite part of the <laughs> <laughs> Literally, <laughs> literally all the way across yeah. the world. Yeah. Yeah. There's, hey, there's literally, hey, there's literally no rainbow trout down there. That doesn't work down there. There's none, man. Oh, yeah, there's. We get uh, spotted sea trout. That's about as far as our oh, trout. I was game just goes. about to say. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, but it, we're, we're in the same vein. Okay. We're in the same vein. Okay. okay. So what's going on, man? What's up? Yeah, what's okay. Up? Yeah. So uh, just going back a little bit, guys. Um, 
so I've been a trainer now for about two years. Um, I wanted to reach out to you guys because I do a lot of in-person training. Everything I do right now is uh, one-on-one personal training. That's everything that I do. And so um, I'll get back, I'll, I'll get to my uh, original question, but just kind of a preface. So I've been training for about two years now. Um, again, everything's one-on-one. Um, I work primarily with, um, with the military. So I do a lot for the military uh, in terms of training. Uh, that's, my, that's my specialty. But uh, with that being said, let me get into my question and it'll, it'll kind of make sense. So, um, so I found y'all's podcast about a month ago. This is a little while ago. So I uh, found y'all about a month ago. Uh, and to say that uh, I've been binging your guys' show is an understatement, man. Y'all, what y'all do for the community is it just God sent, man. So I genuinely appreciate what you guys do. Um, da, 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 da. So um, I've, lot, uh, I've learned a lot from you guys. Uh, it's just made me a better trainer all around. So uh, I'm a lifelong lifter, uh, athlete. Uh, I played football, basketball, uh, love strongman, always been into weightlifting and, and things. Those are my sports of choice. Um, I became a trainer 100% for the accountability portion. So I, at my worst, well, I, I was 400 pounds. Uh, and going the wrong way, uh, everything was just just in a bad place. Uh, and I knew that I needed to do something big to shake up my life. And so now I went through NASM. I got certified uh, trainer, uh, uh, certified nutrition coach, corrective exercise specialist. Like I, I went all in. So uh, my training setup is unique in that most of my clients are in the military and are assigned to me by the command that they work under uh, to prepare them for their physical readiness requirements. Um, I have some clients who are not in the military, but may be military dependents or retirees. So uh, a bit of range in dealing with uh, regular needs uh, and also uh, paired up with the needs of the military. So um, I think you can see the inherent problem here with this setup, though, when I get into my question. So I don't have uh, I don't have to go get my clients. Uh, I don't know how to reach a broader crowd uh, of prospective clients. Um, I say all that to say this, I want to scale my business, my personal training business up and out uh, and and try to work primarily online uh, in that virtual space, but I don't know how to get there. Uh, I'm always looking to be just a better trainer all around. So all, I, I try to use as many resources as I can. Uh, I just love the human condition, man. And I just love this, this space working here. So uh, to get into my question, man, where the hell do I start? How do I start? Should I start organically by designing just workout and nutrition programs? Uh, how do I generate online business? Uh, and should I spend hundreds of dollars a month with one of these companies that just coach trainers, even though they're they're really not in the fit- fitness space, they're more sales based? Uh, what do you guys got for me? You got anything on this topic? Did you know that we're one of those businesses? Yeah. <laughs> I you? know, right? <laughs> so kind of you know? in a roundabout way, right? Yeah. Well, no, we actually we actually have a coaching arm that we launched yeah. in January. Yeah, so we, we literally have a community of nothing but coaches and trainers that we mentor and solve this exact problem you have. In fact, tonight Sal and I have a free live webinar for any coaches and trainers to join us. And it's all about scaling your business to six figures. That's exactly. And we're literally, we're literally going to talk all about this type of stuff. And that's uh, and then we have a online course that you buy. That's over 40 hours of content that we, and, and it's all this stuff. So what we saw, by the way, I love the certs that you went out and got, yeah. <laughs> what we saw was a, a need there was a huge gap between all the great certifications out there. And then all of a sudden, how do you tran- translate all that into making money and building a business? Well, none of the certs do a good job of talking about the business aspect. They do a great job of making you a, a great trainer, educate you around nutrition, biomechanics. Those are all very, very important to being a good trainer. But then they leave this huge gap on, okay, now how do I go get clients and build a business? We filled that need. So that was our, our focus is not in those 40 hours of content. It's not biomechanics. It's not nutrition training. It's all around the business. So like you gotcha. are, our, you're our perfect demographic of people. If you're not already following the Instagram page, mind pump trainer, you got to be following yep. that if you're not. Okay. So absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that was the reason why we launched that was to start to build that community. We also have a free Facebook forum also, which is Doug, what's the title of that one? Personal trainer growth secrets. Yeah. Personal trainer growth secrets. Got so, it. uh, beyond that, that's where we'll also every other month, Sal and I will be doing these live webinars for free. So we're constantly, Fantastic. Getting, yeah. So definitely be on there tonight because this isn't like a short answer of like, Hey, go do this. Cause if it was that easy, everybody would just be able to answer this and give it to you. There are some yeah. steps 
of what that looks like as far as building content. A lot of it early on is throwing spaghetti on the wall and seeing what people want to hear and learn from you. A mistake a lot of trainers make when they're at the place that you're at right now is going, and this is a mistake I think we all made, is like, hey, uh, mine was athletes. I was an athlete. I love playing sports. I want to train athletes. And so I, I yeah. would speak to that. <laughs> but what I started to find was, man, when I would talk about corrective exercise stuff, joint pain, aches, stuff like that, it resonated with people way more. And so yeah. it's also part about finding your voice, finding out like, okay, I have a plan. This is what I think I want to build a business around, but realizing, oh, wow, people are gravitating towards when I speak to this or do that. That is what's going to reveal how we start to build our online presence. Early on, though, it's a lot of trial and error. And we again, we'll get into all this stuff tonight. We'll talk about the throwing the spaghetti on the wall and helping you like get ideas around that and then starting to formulate what is my online presence and 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 business start to look like. But yeah, bro, you you're like uh you're supposed to be with us. <laughs> yeah, That's, this uh, is absolutely, man. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I will be there for sure. Uh, I'll make sure that I'm signed up. The only thing is I'm 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 uh, I'm knee deep in the Smokies right now, man. We're out here with my, uh, my big hiking group out here. Uh, shout out to hike that out of new Orleans, man. We're, uh, we're uh, 10 deep out here. So, you know, we, we oh. have our annual big trip out here. So, awesome. um, but if, if we got, if, if I have the service, uh, yeah, man, I'll be there. Come hell or high water. I'll well, no there. matter what, if you're, if you register when we get off right now, we're gonna you, replay. you get a, re a replay yeah. on it. So okay. even if you can't watch Good. it all and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you'll be able to access now, and, and then, and now, then hopefully Abe, see you there. Abe, you're, you, you're, so right now at the moment, you're training people in person and you're getting your clients sent to you. Yes. So they come in, they apply for the service. They, they see that we offer personal training. Uh, it kind of goes up the ladder and then our, uh, the manager of the facility, uh, facilitates that out. So we'll pick up a client based on who's up in rotation. So the sales part of it is, is I know a little bit about sales. I've been in sales before, uh, but actually in this space, in the fitness space, I'm, I'm completely green. I mean, I don't even know where to start. Like, Hey, you know, let me show you what I can do. Like that's, yeah. that's kind of oh, where we, I'm at right now. We got a course, we got a sales course in our, we have a certification course and in there there's a sales uh, segment where I really break down the sales process. It is unique to training, but once you kind of get it down, it's makes a huge difference. So how many clients are you training right now or how many sessions are you, are you servicing a week? Um, right now I run about five sessions a week, five, five to six, depending on if I can get them to show up. But typically I run about five or six sessions a week right now. Okay. One-on-one -on -one personal training. And yeah. then do you do anything else uh, on the side for, for income or is that all you're doing? Five, six sessions. A so week? right. I really, truthfully, man, I just got into programming. So uh, I've been kind of really um, honing in, honing in on that skill of getting really good at programming. Okay. Obviously, I mean, I follow some of you guys' programming and just try to implement that and, um, you know, into my own kind of programming, into the, the, the rotations and things. And I stress a lot about nutrition and so forth and mm -hmm. so on. And I, when I talk to people, that's typically when they're like, oh, well, can you make me something? I say, yeah, man, sure. I can kind of do that. And I've, over, I think I've sold three programs over the last couple of weeks or so, something like that. So it's slowly coming around and I'm kind of understanding how to do it, but I just, I'm always looking to be a better yeah. trainer. I'm always okay. looking to, to increase my knowledge in this space. And so, you know, I'm, am I doing it right? That's really the question and it, that uh, at the bedrock of all of this. And Abe, how long have you been training uh, clients for in person? Uh, two years. Okay. Two so, years full on. Yeah. Every week. Okay. So every week, five to eight sessions for about two years. Roughly about that. Yeah. Okay. I would focus on, uh, trying to build that first before trying to go online. I would try to get myself to at least 20 sessions a week of one-on-one -on -one because when you get, you got to get really good at training in person before mm -hmm. you get good at training online, training people online, coaching people online virtually it's, it's exponentially more challenging because you don't have the person in front of you. You can't read them. You don't see what's going ask on. Ask the right questions, which takes a lot of experience to be able to see that yes. predicted ahead of time. So yeah, I think yeah, Sal's I on point. Now, I don't, I don't think now I, and I think it's okay to try to do them simultaneously. And the way yeah. I would do it is I would build a social media presence somewhere. You, your yeah. choice, but what you present on there is just something of value that your clients would like. So the workout of the week, or here's a problem people often have, and here's my solution type of deal. But you want to make it something real valuable. And don't worry about how many followers you have. Even if you just had 50 people following you, but they're really engaged, that's like 50 potential customers. And then build yeah. your in-person business before really trying to go hard online. Because I, I, it's totally yeah. realistic to get you up to 20 sessions a week. Well, now, and that, okay. and that, that approach is just... 
literally working your community. You literally walk outside the door and you do body fat test booths, introduce yourself to people, offer free one-on-one workouts for a few weeks, um, work with referrals. That would be the, the the place that I would start if you're trying to really build a career in fitness. Abe, one of my favorite ways to help a trainer like you where you're currently at, where you're already servicing people consistently like this, is literally every day you talk to a client, you train at least a client or so. So when you're with them in that hour time, I know there is always something that they either ask you or you teach them. That's a piece of content. And just literally let that steer what you post up on Instagram or Facebook or whatever platform you're on. So you're you're training Steve today, and Steve's talking about his knee stuff going on, and it's achy. And you're like, oh well, you gotta we gotta get that on that ankle mobility and some hip stuff. And and you teach him something. That's a piece that's of your con- post. That's a yeah. piece of content. Yeah. Now what's beautiful about that is that now it serves him. And you can tell them, hey, by the way, Steve, make sure you're following me on IG because I made sure to do a little video just to remind you anytime you forget, these are the moves you're supposed to be doing. Meanwhile, you're going to attract other people that are struggling with the same things that Steve is. Next day, you're training Margaret and Margaret's talking about how she can't get her shoulder all the way back on her left side and you start helping her with things, right? And that's your content. So let your people that you're helping already steer the content you put online. That way you're already, it's adding more value value to the people you're serving. Meanwhile, it's attracting people you're already helping. And so that yeah, is I how think- you start to build. And we taught, this is the type of shit we get into, bro. This is a stuff. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, so th- no, you guys are exactly right. So I started on the social media. That's kind of the route that I took. Uh, so across all social media, I started to, you know, my own business, a train project fit. And that's how I started it. And as soon as I started making these little videos, that's when people started kind of you know, gravitating. So no, you, you, you guys are right on the money, man. It's, yep. I was just hoping that I had picked the right course of action with trying to scale out the social media. I have a love hate relationship with social media, but I'm, I'm just learning to lean into it, especially for business. I mean, it's, it's really, it's the best mode of, of business really that's out there. So uh, no, you got you guys are you guys are jam up, man. I mean that's that's you're answering everything that I need. I was just hoping I was on the right path. You are, yeah, you yeah. are, man. And I look forward to seeing you in the community. I know you're out having fun right now, but we'll make sure to get you inside that coaching that platform, and we'll be talking to you, man. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much, and and again, thank you for what you do. You know, for our industry, and you know, you guys are a torchbearer. So genuinely appreciate it. You got it, brother. Thank you, Abe. Thanks, Abe. All right, you guys take care. You too. You know, I got to say that the explosion of online coaching it really, really took off during COVID uh, mm-hmm. for obvious reasons. But the, the explosion of it, which is not a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it's good. More access to coaches and trainers. It grows the fitness space, brings more yeah, awareness the around there. nutrition, all that. But but the, the, the dark side of it has been this influx of trainers and coaches who don't have any or little experience training people in person. And I'm going to say this right now. It might be controversial, but it's true. If you haven't trained people in person for a while and you didn't do a good job doing it for a while, you're probably going to suck virtually. It, oh, yeah. That's the experience that's almost, I don't want to say it is necessary. It's almost necessary. You've got to really be a special individual to never have trained someone in person and do a good job virtually. Uh, for most people, like build it in person, do that first, then move over to the online uh, world because otherwise you, it's going to be tough. You know what sucks for the consumer though, what you just said is- they suck as trainers, but many times they actually get make a lot of money and they make a lot of business. They do a lot of business because the, what they figure out a lot of times is the social media hack, right. how to gain attention, how to be mm-hmm. entertaining, how to do all the clickbaity things, right? That gets all this attention and sell people on programs. But to your point, you still suck as a trainer. So yeah. just because you're making $10,000 a month selling digital stuff doesn't mean you're necessarily a good coach. Trainer. Now he, on the other hand, is a great coach I love to get my hands on because you got two years of training people right. consistently. You got good national certs behind you. You got corrective exercise specialist, which I think that's like one of the best certifications you can get. So I can take somebody like that who's got a lot of practical knowledge of actually helping people in person and help that translate into on, online. But man, this is what we this is what we built the course for. Is literally it. th- this, this is I mean, it. and again, you know, so, it's just, all in there. Just speaking to someone like him, if you're only training five to eight hours, that's what it is. Five to eight hours a week. Place your focus there before you place a big focus on, I need to build an online business. That, that doesn't, again, it doesn't mean you don't post online and build some authority there and, and, and connect with people on there as well. I think you do both, but most of your energy should be on what's in front of you. And what's in front of you is like, it is easier to go from eight sessions a week to 25 sessions a week 
than it is to build a online business suddenly yeah. that's going to totally just highlight you. what you're doing with them to your that's right. point earlier make content out of it and and definitely build those case studies so you know that that attracts people uh as well and and part of what that looks like tactically is adding value to the current customers so by sal yes. means by figure out what in front of you this is why i like the online advice that i gave it's because Though it's not like, oh, this is what's going to make you go viral, or all of a sudden you're going to get ten thousand followers. What are you already doing? It's that I. This is already going to help my client Steve, who right. I'm helping right now. Like mm -hmm. that's going to help him, and so it adds value to him. Oh, and it may also gain me a few followers along the way. That's like a win-win. So you want to look for ways that you can lean into and help the the community you're already talking to, because those people are going to be the people that go out and tell their sister, their uncle, their brother, their that's friend right. that, oh my God, Abe is the best coach and trainer. He did all this. Like that, that's going to, it's a slower game, but that's what's going to build the right foundation for you to be really successful long-term. All right. I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. 30% body fat. For men, this is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible, but not if you guess along the way. So we're gonna talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now there's a huge range, right? Of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher body.